Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my stream tonight. Um, today, we're going to talk about compi com compiling for syntax specifically. Um, there was some discussion, uh, especially on Twitter, about some other compiler topics. And I, I've covered those in the past. I actually had a really good stream on compilation back in, I'd say, end of November, early December, where I spent four hours talking about compilation and optimizations and that whole topic. Plus, we, you know, week to week, we cover different stuff. Um, admittedly, I don't think we get to completely avoid it because uh, this week in JavaScript, uh, there was some discussion, so we, uh, we can dig into it a bit. Actually, I'm pretty excited to talk about this week in JavaScript because um, there has been a lot of different discussions going on and kind of funny and interesting ones, really just a continuation of last week, but we've seen them kind of, a lot of these things grow and um, kind of manifest into new things. Um, anyways, if you're joining me, um, come by, say, say hi in the chat. Um, oh, wow, hello. Gonna give it a couple seconds here. Sorry, I don't have the cool, like, we'll start streaming intro music or anything. This is about as low budget as it gets. Like my blurred background, it's, it's terrible. But um, until I get a green screen and a permanent place to stream, um, this is what we're dealing with. Hi. Thanks for joining the stream tonight. Yeah, fairy tale reference. Glad some, some, some people got that. Um, it's hilarious to me, like, um, yeah, obviously, solid script is actually a thing in, in fairy tale anime. Uh, good. Starting to see people join on. That's great. Mm, yeah. No, to, today was a good day for me, actually, wasn't it? I didn't, I took the day off work and went hiking um, over in the East Bay area, and it was, it was a wonderfully sunny day in these green hills and I had, had a really good time got a lot of sun um which I'm not as used to I mean I've been living in California now for two years but it's still still a bit of a shocker I, I'm from Vancouver Canada where it's just like rain 60 70 percent of the year the summer is beautiful but like it's like all rain yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah, it's funny because, but you know, like when, when you, like when Rich Harris first, uh, well, uh, you know, we'll get into it when we, when we talk about some stuff. Cause I can say like just the whole, you know, JavaScript, whatever script I've heard Svelte being called Svelte script. And then I was like, okay, let's call it solid script. I, Reactive script. I read an article about that uh, in the fall, which we'll talk about a bit today too. So yeah, let's just, yeah, we got some people here. It's been three minutes. Let's, let's, let's get started. And talk about this week in JavaScript. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here, which I probably should have prepped before the stream, but you know, here we are. I'm going to talk about some solid stuff, um, largely. Uh, last week there was a few other solid things I didn't talk about because we were focusing on Svelte, but this is a solid week, so let's talk about solid. Um, so I'm actually going to start right from right uh, last Friday, like a week ago. Um, this thread about reflecting on perceptions of solid. I'm just going to read it out loud in case anyone missed this. Um, but it's kind of interesting to me because this, this whole thing came out because of a kind of conversation, um, you know, about is solid better than React and all, all this kind of dialogue. And it's a funny one. I, I was actually on JS Jabber this week um, recording the podcast and it came up again. And it, uh, the, the funniest thing and is that, and this relates to some of the topics this week as well, is, I chose JSX for a very specific reason. And Solid already had reactive primitives that looked like hooks before hooks came out. So like none of this was trying to look like JS, uh, like React, except now we just happened to. And once like we got close enough, you know, I was like, you know, they got good ideas, it's really well designed APIs, you know? So I, you know, I, I did definitely borrow um, elements of it, especially in terms of the, like the tuples for the hooks. But the funniest thing was I was never trying to make solid look like React. I just believed in the same things and respected, you know, the, like had, had a reason to use JSX. And <laughs> then React added hooks and it's like, okay, well, here we are. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read this for a second to kind of get an idea here. Um, 
because my reflection on Solid is this, it's tricky. Solid first came to attention because of performance, right? Um, architecturally, because it's very different, it's capable of doing things that other frameworks can't, but that won't sell most people on. And I linked this great Fred K. Scott um, clip here, which I quite enjoyed, um, where, you know, he showed this little graph showing like how much faster this benchmark solid happens to be than some of the other solutions. But it's more about performance, right? Like the server rendering performance is even better than the client side, but no one really talks about that. And, you know, then we got attention because of, as I mentioned, JSX and hooks with a VDOM. People are like, oh, you solved the, the React problem. Um, you know, uh, some people actually pinged, when I first joined Twitter, people pinged uh, Dom, Dominic Ganaway, who was working on prepacked uh, for, for Facebook to add comp compilation into React. And they're like, he solved this. He says he solved this. How could you guys didn't solve it? He must be like basically suggesting that I was a liar. But I didn't actually solve the same problem. I was working on a different system. Reactivity is very different than React. So solving compilation for React the way that Dominic was trying to do was, is actually pretty difficult. Um, right. So it's kind of funny because then we got attention because you know we could do suspense and concurrent rendering. Um, so it started this sort of svelte for React narrative. But Solid's reactivity is runtime. It's not like a compiler across the board, which again, we'll talk about today. Only the JSX is compiled. And now we're seeing this discussion around automatic dependency detection and you know, independent updates. You know, this whole React as it should have been. No use refs, stale closures, or hook rules. And I, I, I think that, you know, Solid has its own considerations. And so I said, you know, we don't need structure props. We have this like one rule, but it's the abstraction, right? So like, and it's 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 not very React at all, um, right? And I was gonna say, Solid is not React. We chose JSX because it's portable and existed. We wrote reactive hooks before reactive hooks were a thing. And then the final thing I put was, I think the way we, Solid scales up and down is really powerful and why I'm so confident about it. When a div is just an HTML div element, the state is a primitive that works on its own like a promise does, you feel like you can do anything. And that's the takeaway. I'm going to do a stream about this um, coming up where I kind of do Solid past, present, future, and we'll kind of you know reflect on this. But I just wanted to start here because I didn't give this thread enough uh, attention last week when it came out because it really has shown that like it's funny. It's it's never a single thing. It's you know, and that's the challenge with something like Solid. There isn't that obvious hook. It's just like people kind of come at it and they're like, oh, and then they're like, okay, well that's interesting, and I'll go back to what I'm doing. And then a few months later, oh, that's interesting. I'll go back to what I'm doing. But at a certain point, they'll probably just be like, oh, so yeah, I, it's it, it's uh, it's just one of those kind of things. And I wanted to kind of talk about it a bit today, just because. This evolution, you know, started several years ago, and it kind of continues um, on today in terms of, you know, us discovering the new powerful things we can do because of this primitive-based architecture. Everything's just small pieces. It makes them very, what's the term? Adaptable. I don't want to say flexible. Flexible usually makes me think of configuration where you have, like, lots of, like, dials to turn. I mean, adaptable as in, like, I have these pieces, like Lego, like, they can be built this way or they can be built this way. And, you know, you just kind of decide what you're trying to build. And then as long as you have the blocks, you, you can do it. And that, that's, that's sort of the mentality here. Uh, some nice comments coming in here while I'm getting started. Yeah, I know it's a terrible time. You know, maybe I can do something about this in the, in the future. Um, you can't you can't really work for for everyone, but I think this is actually probably the worst possible time to be streaming. So I do appreciate people coming here. Like you stream like first thing in the morning, it's really good for Europe. It's like dinner time ish, and you know people you know all the way across North America can see it. But you basically um, cut off people in uh, South the South Pacific, you know, in Asia and stuff. So this time is better for the for them. So I guess there's that trade off. But I think classically. Um, solids grown more in North America and Europe. So there's a little tension there, I guess. Anyways, uh, keep on going. Uh, so yeah, what else was cool that kind of came up? Capacitor, solid, beat, capacitor. I, I, I'm super stoked on this because again, I haven't tried it yet. And maybe there's something we can try on stream. I don't know like how much native stuff, like do I need to get like Android Studio working on here, you know, to get it working. But like, 
seeing solid on on mobile makes me pretty happy stoked like it's one of those things where you know i didn't have to do any work and people have built this it's it's amazing <laughs> yeah yeah you're probably you're probably west coast like like i am so yeah um so yeah this is really cool um ionic um you know and capacitor solid beat i haven't played with it yet but yeah ios android apps pwas really really cool um another cool thing that 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 happened this week was some amazing articles were were written um really uh and uh the first one that i saw uh was from taylor hunt and to be fair um you know what I, I'm going to I'm going to pause on this one for a minute. I want to get back to here. The reason I want to get back to here is because this is going to tie in some stuff we're going to talk to you about in a minute. Um, before we go there, I, I actually want to continue on this uh, maybe raw, raw, solid conversation for a moment and talk about um, the ecosystem thing. Because right after we did the stream on Friday, um, basically for the next two days, it had nothing to do with the stream. I've just been right after we got the stream. Everyone started talking about ecosystem and uh, this is kind of a, it, it's a funny topic for me because like ecosystem means different things to different people. And it, it's always interesting to me when like the popular solution and people who are, you know, proponents of the popular solution come out and just start really pushing the ecosystem argument because like, it's fine. Everyone knows that, like, that's why the solution is popular, but when they get to a point where they feel like they have to justify it, you know, it suggests that maybe you're doing the right things. Um, like this, this, this was a funny one. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say, yeah, I like that there's quotes around three technologies better than React. And I'm actually going to blow this up one more little bigger so you can see it better. But like Preact, Svelte, and Solve. These offer better performance, smaller bundles, more elevated APIs, but I'm not using them. Why? Ecosystem. React ecosystem makes it compelling to me. And then someone, there was like two or three of those kind of floating around. And then someone else was like, okay, well, um, these ecosystems have you like 99% covered the time they don't, you feel, you don't feel lost and you get a chance to contribute. Don't bind to use React for the ecosystem. <laughs> P.S. it's just fun. So it's, it's a kind of funny argument because I think they're both right. I think from a pure like library standpoint, third party library standpoint, like you, you'll find what you're looking for in the, these ecosystems. Solid is like a little bit lacking on that, maybe on the component libraries, but that that's a gap that's going to be covered in no time. It's felt has you covered and view like, I don't even know why views in this list. Right. But when you talk about ecosystem, you talk about job market, you talk about hiring. It's a whole other thing. React has really cornered this. And, you know, regardless of, you know what we say or not it's the it's 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 the true fact right but i i just gotta say this though like being included on these lists and this being the conversation like what, what did i say here right like i'm so stoked um like if, if that's all that's holding you back like what else can i hope for what else can what, what else can we do you're like it's like it's just like saying like this is more popular and has, you know, more, more, you know, people working, you know, around it, then that's why I'm using it. It's like, well, of course, like, that's a good reason. I, I, I worked at a startup where we had a custom stack and I worked at it for eight years. And I said, I was never wanting on the library side. We always could do exactly what we wanted. And, you know, we, made, we had, you know, good developer experience and we built a good system around it. But, you know, uh, uh, eight years later, we actually ended up uh, re doing a rewrite with uh, React, and we, it's funny, we hit new problems, and we tried other libraries in the open source, and they didn't quite work, and then we had to patch them. Like, it was it was the same thing. We didn't, like, it, on the library side, it didn't actually feel any nicer or better, but you know what was nicer? We just started picking up, like, college grads, and, like, like just picking up, like, people who just out of boot camps, and they were up to speed. No more training. Like, that was huge for our startup to be able to like ramp people up and you know not worry about how much of an investment we had to put into talent. So like I, I respect the, that argument, 
um, in terms of like hiring and job pools, like completely. It's just like to know that that's the only thing, like that's, that's sweet, you know, <laughs> like, you know, keep, keep on making posts like this. People will see it and go, maybe they'll just read the first sentence and just be like, you know, you know, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, what do we got here? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it makes sense. So, yeah, um, yeah. This 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 just kind of comes with the territory, and you know, um, yeah. And 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 this is a good point, right? Like, why 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 even bother, right? The problem is there are problems and solutions you know, React actually isn't the best at. And I'm not saying Solid is actually going to be the best solution in those cases necessarily. I'm just saying like there, there are places where React actually isn't the logical like choice, like not at all. And, you know, it's it, like at a certain point, you know, you just go, okay, well, I'm going to try something new. Maybe maybe I'll build an asphalt. Like at a certain point, someone's going to do that. And eventually the tide turns if, if that's the case. I mean, it's, it is hard. I, I, I don't... I have no illusions to this, you know, like, it, like, it's just a self perpetuating thing. And the more and more popular it gets, like, I don't even know, like, did Angular lose its, like, edge when Angular 2 came out? Or was it just because React was that much better? Like, it was it, like, I'm not actually sure. And, you know, it, like, does the does the like, the, the leader have to lose their lead for something else to pop up? I'm not sure. Like, there's there's not there's, there's an argument that stuff isn't compelling enough. Like, regardless, like, Svelte, for example, is incredibly successful on the mindshare side, but not not as much on the adoption side. Like, maybe maybe that's just a reality we live in. I guess I guess we'll have to see. I'm I'm just I'm just not so pessimistic. I I think that when when the opportunity strikes and as time passes, other things will get their chance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and and when there's a chance, the chance will happen. And I, so I'm not worried about this. I mean, I didn't get into this because I thought I would like win the framework battle on like, like there's so many other things. Like I, I, I was in music for a long time, right? And the thing you know about in music is it's like 90% marketing and put yourself out there. Yeah, like sure, write a catchy song. But like it, it, it's like there's so many, like talent isn't going to get you to number one. Like it'll get you, it's, it's, it's incredibly helpful to be talented, but there's so many aspects to it. And like anything, like even if something was strictly the best technology, which nothing ever is, that's still not enough. <laughs> like there, there's, there's just so much to it. Right. So yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's, that's, that's what we need. That's, that's not what we need. No, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I, the fact that these conversations are happening are cool. These threads were interesting to me because, you know, yeah, safe enough for the long term. You know, Rich Harris getting hired by Bursell to work specifically on Svelte, that's big. You know, that's the kind of stuff that's going to make or break libraries at, at, at Solid or Svelte stage. And I'm not saying that Solid's at Svelte stage yet, but you know, like there, there, there is a, there is a, uh, how should I put it? There is a trajectory that I'm seeing for new frameworks. I was looking at this on the JS framework benchmark, right? If you look, if you look, not JS framework, sorry, the JS survey thing. If you look at the, at like 2015, 16, new frameworks actually launched up really quickly and they gained like 10, 15% a year. Like you rise with meteoric, like react. They, 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 they went up actually fairly quickly and they, then they hit their plateau and they, and they kind of barely moved. Svelte for the last three years has moved up slower, but just keeps on moving up. Nothing else has been moving up over that time period um, in terms of like usage. So I think this is just like a, the slow climb and that's what we're in for unless something fundamental changes. <laughs> you guys are great. Yeah, this is this is this is this is an interesting topic for me, and I I think it's I, I think it's cool that people are discussing it and being realistic about it. Um, 
already talked about, I forget what my was, did I have more? Yeah, there's things we control and things we can. As much as reaffirmation of doing the right things, ecosystems come with time and it all starts with people recognize the potential, yeah. So yeah, I, that's really my, my closing point on, on this one. You know, I mean, I, I've seen the nasty other side of it, right? So where is it not where it here? Which is that side. I, I mean, I'm not gonna, I can't give too many details here obviously, but you can imagine if you work at a company that doesn't use React and the other popular companies um, that are of the same size or caliber use React, there is definitely a friction and misunderstanding with developers. I've witnessed this, um, you know, where, the, you know, there's this thinking that like you're hurting their job, future job prospects, like you're hurting their resume. Um, I, I, I've, I've been, I've, I've been told that, that, that we're like basically we don't care about their future because we're, we would might be making them use a framework that's not react. That's insane to me. Like, but I get it right. Their, their view of the world is that they go into a resume, someone's going to ask, or sorry, into an interview, someone's going to ask them about the specific detail about hook rules and like when to use ref and stuff. And they're just not going to have that experience. Sure. They built a hobby project, but they never did anything to scale for me coming up. It was all about just learning the framework and the tools. And when I did one, I learned all about that. When I did the next one, well, I learned about that. And now that I know about two, I was able to connect the dots, see the similarities and my understanding of both increased. That's why I'm here today because I spent so much time working on different solutions, benchmarking them, studying them. It was understanding, you know, doing real work in one, doing work in another, and then kind of learning the thing that's not written down in the docs. And, but how do you tell someone that? How do you tell someone when it's like their first job out of college and they're like, I thought I was going to be able to use React and now where can I get hired? Um, like it, it, it's, 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 it, it's, it's a challenging thing. Yeah, yeah. Like I, if you talk to hiring managers, like I do hiring myself, I do interviews, but I can, I'm not hiring for a React position. So maybe like, you, I'm excited when people have good React experience to that. Like it shows that they, as long as you understand declarative libraries, gone through the patterns of the trials, that shows that you're able to learn it. It's not like, like, you know, being able to recite the, the hook rules in reverse order or, or something, you know, while standing on your toes or standing on your head or something like I, it, but you know, it's, it's hard to appreciate. Uh, Ember was a fun framework, but yeah, this is, this, this, this is the thing, right? Frameworks are a mode of space, just like programming language. At the end of the day, the finished product is all that matters. Yes, yes. And do you know what's even a hotter space, in my opinion, than frameworks? Or maybe it's why frameworks are a hot space? Syntax. That's that's what we're, we're here today, like talking about syntax, is because God is that an area where people are like opinionated and it like it, sometimes it matters. And I talked about the one I was talking about compiler optimizations, but sometimes it does not matter and it's purely superficial and people just go crazy over the fact that they have to type like four more characters on a few lines like even if it's like conceptually one for one like I, I, I it's not something that I appreciate enough and that's kind of why I want to do this exploration today but well, you know yeah yeah this this is an interesting one right because I think declarative frameworks are a skill like some people kind of talk and hire about talk about like hiring on like JavaScript and I, I'm not saying this is what you're saying, but like fundamentals, you know, and like accessibility. Like there, there's a whole bunch of native, you know, knowledge of, around the platform that's really helpful. Understanding progressive enhancement, like all, all these things, and I mean, we we hire on JavaScript um, on our team because we do a lot of platform work. It makes a lot of sense, but I, I do think declarative. Um, I do think declarative frameworks are a skill set, but I don't care if it was Vue 
or solid or no one's getting heard of solid experience sorry um like or or, or react or, you know or marco or whatever I don't, I don't i don't care about which library it is <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, I, this is why I want to explore syntax, and we'll, we'll we'll get there in a minute. I just the ecosystem conversation was just too much of a hotbed, and I wanted to talk about it. So now I'm going to get back to where I was going because I still got a few more topics here. This week in JavaScript was rich, and it was really cool. Um, so I want to talk about the Taylor Hunt story because how many times? Um, and I'm going to go into here. Yeah, let's click into this one. How many times like you see this situation? This is for some e-commerce site I think it's called Kroger, and. How many times are you in this situation where you're, I don't know, tasked with like, he's, he was tasked to do with the, the rewrite and he essentially was trying to get his company's metrics up, right? And he, basically they had React Redux set up, which was like 44.7 kilobytes before any feature. And they, they were doing their page test scores and they just weren't good. And they're like, you know, they're like, how, how can we get better performance here? And he goes and details this a bit. <laughs> Five stages of grief on performance. Like this article is hilarious. And, you know, he spent a lot of time trying different stuff and testing it. And what was really kind of interesting for me is, you know, he, he looked around for suggestions and like help. He was like, well, if I need to improve performance, how do I, how do I improve performance? Like, what, what, what are the things I have to do? And, you know, he, he looked, Alex Russell has a great article that I've cited in the past about, can you afford it? Real world performance budgets, which suggested that, you know, like, you know, he said he has a pretty high number that, you know, we should be in this 130 to 170 range. But like, I've seen the number of, like from Addy Osmani or was it Jake Archibald's articles about like, the cost of JavaScript that, that suggests that number should be more like 80 on the initial page load. But, you know, it, essentially, like he, he's trying to, you know, cut down his page. So for some reason he did a bunch of math and he realized that he wanted to get to 20 kilobytes. Okay, so they bumped them up to 250 now. Yeah, I mean, I guess the bottom end devices were up, but what his test frame, that he had, had a much lower number. So he was trying to get to 20 kilobytes. And then he started looking at like, he, he said, what I did, I went to Amazon and made up a really bad user agent to see like what they loaded. And basically the, the, it, it loaded like the most basic page. And yeah, so he's like, okay, we can make things smaller. Like there's a way to get that kind of performance. Cause Amazon actually is one of the, actually for a large e-commerce site has actually relatively pretty good performance. And if you saw tweets from a few months ago, part of that is because they don't use any JavaScript frameworks. They There was like a whole thread that kind of raised some heat because they're like, yeah, we can't use React SSR, it's too slow. Um, so um, essentially, he, he, he what he landed on was MPAs essentially, um, because that was the only way to cut the JavaScript down. And what, I, what was interesting, what I loved about this, this article was he was in this like place where he, he couldn't, he wasn't allowed to touch the backend API, right? And he had like these cascading calls and he tried to like optimize them as best he could. But, you know, so he, you know, dealing with time to first fight and all these things and <laughs> the problem, web performance is other people. Basically, within his own organization, he he didn't have enough control to actually change the backend, right? Like there's so many places. so. What he ended up doing was kind of go, realizing that he wanted to do an MPA for this case. He did, again, figuring out, let's say what here, figuring out, what was this here? Let's say you have 10 data sources that are listed in one API call. What are the odds my server can respond quickly enough? <laughs> he basically calculated that there, he would never have a chance of actually getting the fastest response. Like one in 10 would get the response he wanted. So blocking for time to first byte was just never an option for him. So eventually he, he came up, he realized that he needed streaming. And in this video, he showed the difference between streaming and not streaming, right? On the right, you can see the, the, the same page 
load right away while it streams in the content well the other page takes the full 2.5 seconds to load in and he's like these take the same time to load but one feels a billion times f faster for the end user was essentially what 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 the argument was and i mean he goes on more but i mean okay fine was this just a big he was like why not svelte he looked at svelte he looked at a bunch of stuff Basically, there was only one solution that did streaming. So, okay, maybe this was just a big ad for Marco. But I, I, the, the point was, this was, wasn't was made by the Marco team. We didn't write this article. I thought this was really cool. If you want to learn more about Marco, check out my stream from two weeks ago. But this this the, he, this this article was really in-depth with how he approached a real-world problem. And, you know, he has a whole bunch of articles here about streaming and, and his history of streaming and he, he did his research and basically at the time, his only solutions were Marco and dust for node. Um, so like, and he's going to continue on it, but I, I just thought this article was, was really awesome. And not just because it plugs Marco at the end, but because essentially like it's nice to see a real world example of this stuff. Of course, this caused a whole other chain of reactions because of course, Remix had to jump in because it was streaming and um, they, they, they like to tell us that streaming isn't isn't uh, fast enough. But you know what? I want to talk about this too because, um, or sorry, that's not streaming as fast as the stream doesn't have a big enough impact. But actually, I figured out the problem why. And um, we'll get to that in a moment because what... <sighs> There was another thing that, that was very similar. Adi Asmani, Az Chrome team, made this chart. And he, he was trying to kind of show all the different ways to render the web. This is on patterns.dev, this chart. And it was, it's, they've been tailoring this chart for years. Like they had it in some old articles from 2017, 18, 19. And in the past, I was just like, yeah, this is mostly right, so I won't leave it alone. But this year, it is like they tried to add new topics and stuff. And the one thing that actually was kind of funny, and I'm not the only one who said it, I read the chart and I was like, this person's been using Next.js because you could tell that all the numbers and all the considerations were very specific to the perspective one would have from using Next.js. Um, and there, especially this whole time to first, a uh, time to interactive versus first contentful paint. This matters completely based on the hydration technique, and none of these actually define what hydration technique that you have to use, right? Like, like there's there is some like obviously CSR doesn't hydrate, but like you can mix and match hydration techniques. I'm working on an article to hopefully bring some clarity to this because people pass this article to me and they're like, "What does it mean by spa behavior limited or caching minimum?" And it's kind of like, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, this, this current chart still has some things, but what was interesting for me for this chart was that Ryan Florence remix decided to make his own chart um, where he crossed off like half the stuff. And at first I was just like, oh, is this like, especially with this red one, I'm like, is this just are we inventing a category for our own framework kind of too? But he actually has a lot of really valid points because this whole hydration row is basically garbage, as I mentioned before. Like it just doesn't have any correlation. And and there's some comments about caching and yeah, all the ambiguous areas, like why why is it limited spa behavior in this case? And like basically just this this whole thing just I, I think we need a rewrite or a redo of this. Um at this point but the one point that he made that i thought was weird was he was like on streaming he crossed out this low and consistent across pages and said depends on what first chunk does server side and user network slow user networks have the same time to first byte as ssr and i was like what that makes no sense how could like streaming, you literally get the response, start rendering and start responding right away. You don't wait for any data. How could that have the same time to first byte as like wait for the data? Like we've seen on, on the stream, we've seen like the impact of, of streaming. How, how could that be the case? And 
I was like, okay. I, I hadn't been paying attention to time to first bite. I've been looking at first paint. And yes, first paint seemed to be the same on a slow network. I've shown this before. So like on a fast network, it's streaming looks much nicer, but on a slow network, um, like it, 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 like the, the stuff kind of showed up at the same time. And it makes sense to a certain degree because, you know, maybe the data is like kind of still coming over the wire and it like it kind of all ends up at the same time. But time to first bite should definitely be faster for streaming. Definitely. It, it wouldn't make sense that it wouldn't. So I, I, I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's go look at this again because, I mean, because... I mean, you, you've, you've seen my timelines here, right? This is this is solid hacker news. This is the remix hacker news. And if we look at the performance, we, we, we've we seen these charts and these graphs before, right? Um, did I compress something on the network side? Yeah, let's open it, right? Um, like the, the whole thing where like, I, actually I wonder if this has early chunks working here or something, I don't know, anyways. But like essentially, usually the page loads and then the assets load um, for, for, for Remix. And then that pushes things out. This, this, this run here was done on slow 3G. So essentially first paint is at 4285 and largest contentful paint is at the exact same time. This is what happens when you do async rendering. And then because at that point um, they have to go request the chunks from the server and then uh, you know get sort of get the JavaScript. It takes a while for hydration to happen, and it's at thirteen five ninety four. In the Solid Hacker News example, while it's streaming here, we're loading the stuff. So you know, yes, our first paint is 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 around the same time on the slow network, but then um, why is this not updating? Our, our largest contentful paint. Um, and and uh, and uh, the, you know, um, sorry, our hydration is done about almost like three seconds sooner. Now, the thing was, I, I was like, I was, I've been focusing so much on this paint stuff, right? So clearly, like in my browser, I can see this is like slight advantage on paint, but it's like minor. Like in the end, it kind of works out the same way. It's hydration costs that kill. And that's a that's a that's a React problem, not a Remix problem. But then I so I went to the network tab and I looked, and it was like time to first byte on this is 2.02 seconds for a solid version, and on the Remix side, time to first byte was 2.03 seconds. The time to first byte was identical. Like it, 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 this this doesn't make any sense. You know, and so Ryan Florence is right, right? So what I, what I did was I was like, okay, what if Chrome Dev Tools are lying to us? Because we're throttling it. Like we're the ones who are ca causing this slow 3G. What if the Chrome Dev Tools are the reason that we can't actually see the performance difference? That was my hunch. And as it turned out, it was the, the right hunch. Because, I mean, we we can we can run these again if we want to. Like we're in slow three D. Like let, let's let's just run these again just to be sure. Because, you know, this takes a second or like fifteen seconds. We'll see a second. Okay, there we go. And let's run this one again, slow 3G. So you can see the streaming, right? Like this loading state loaded sooner, right? Okay, cool, now we're done. But again, 201, Oh, this was four or fifteen. Maybe this is a bad run for Remix. I, it should be this. It should be the same. Um, I don't feel like running it again. But my my point is that when I went to one of those like 
sites, like the, the, the same site that Taylor linked and grabbed a 3G connection in Mumbai, India and said, let's, let's run this here instead and see what the difference is. And honestly, if you look at these, these, oh, what did, it, what did I do? I went film strip view. If you look at these plots here, what you're going to see, can I, can I scroll sideways? Maybe, maybe I do need to go to this film strip view. It takes basically 2.5 seconds to get to the loading. So it's, it takes a long time. And then you see the final thing at three seconds. But our first byte is at 1.634 seconds. On the remix one, first is at 2.387 seconds. So the first byte is pushed back. And this isn't a big data request. This is not like that demo I had where we loaded like 1400 comments. This is just like 30 comments, the 30 stories on the front page. The, the, the total time ends up being like basically the same here. Like, like for rendering, it's like three second mark, right? So it's not like a big deal. Sol solid shows the, or streaming shows like the loading placeholder for about half a second before that. So like the page loads, like maybe that's not the best experience. If it was a longer data load, like with more data, that would be more impactful. But, and the final time is about the same for visual, not necessarily timed interactive. But, but the thing is you can see Streaming actually has a benefit. And, and look at this, look at, look at the waterfall diagram here. I wanna show you something. Even under the slow network, we can see this, the, the same, here's the HTML coming in and the assets starting to get loaded while the HTML is coming in, which lets us get our work started sooner. And in the remix example, we see, here's us waiting for the HTML page to finish before we load anything. And which obviously pushes back hydration, which this does not measure here. This is not this is not showing us hydration costs because you see it finishes visual here. Hydration is still going out uh, out the four second mark um, beyond what we're looking at, and it's it's still true here on solid, solid too. But it just it's just interesting to me that that um, essentially you in in Chrome you don't actually get to see the benefits of of the streaming. Um, in the dev tools when you have a slow network, when you're doing the artificial slowdown, but you can when you test it in an actual environment. Yeah, so. Sure, probably. And the, we're, we're all the stuff's from Cloudflare, so it probably isn't as big of a deal, but I, I did want to mention, like it is a 3G, so it is a slower network and, I said, I, we can make worse, more ag aggressive demos, which show streaming perform even better. I just wanted to show that the dev tools are actually misleading. And I'm sure that's what everyone does, right? You, you make an example, you test it, and then you go in the dev tools and you simulate slowdown. And that's not the full story. So time to first byte is faster with streaming. Makes sense. It's just the dev tools hide that fact. So... Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can't simulate properly. So I think I, I that was I know this is kind of a tangent on on this sort of chart thing, but yeah, this needs some reworking. But at least um, there is more benefit to streaming than the Chrome Dev Tools would witness, which means that I think the I think I I do think that um, this the the whole thing about streaming here isn't actually correct so just wanted to kind of th throw that out there so anyone who's like playing around with streaming and is like playing down with network slowdowns that's not the best way to to kind of test it um what else was fun this week <laughs> there's there's a couple more things okay yeah we're not quite there yet This article from Igor Miner, uh, for you guys who don't know, Igor um, was one of the lead devs on Angular for like over a decade. And he left Angular last year to join Cloudflare um, to work on like the future of web, essentially. He's working on the workers, pages team, or sorry, workers. And like b basically he's, he's there to kind of build a new, better experience around Cloudflare. And... Um, this is a really powerful post. He talks about the history of web dev from his perspective, which is great. He goes through like 
over a decade worth of history going through like each stage and shortcoming and how the next thing replaced the, the, the previous. Um, what I thought was really cool was that, um, let me see if I can find it here, was that um, he told this really personal story, um, which was really quite moving about experiences. And then when we got to, to here, he talks about generation zero, which is what he calls like the pre Ajax age. And then generation one, which is like angular one and then generation two, which is where we are right now. Solid gets shout out, you know, which is sweet. Um, but then, he, you know, he's talking about the, the problem with single page apps and fate sharing and, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. And, and, and basically, though, what he's signaling is about the return to server and more specifically, re, re, the return to the edge. And um, he gives a little bit of thoughts on what he considers what uh, Generation 3 looks like. He's He talks a bit about Quick and he talks a bit about Remix and Islands and he even gives Marco a shout out which and Wiz, which was Google's like internal progressive thing. But basically suggests that, you know, a lot of the same stuff we've been talking about on stream, talking about JavaScript first architectures, um, talking about, you know, making infrastructure accessible on the edge, um, you know, portability of compute, um, monolithic versus distributed. Um, and, and he talks about streaming. So I, I thought this was a really, um, really interesting, detailed um, article. And I think everyone should, if they get a chance, should check it out. Um, and I mean, he, he, he wasn't done, like, honestly, um, sorry, the, Taylor's follow-up article has this whole thing. Show, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll, we'll go over that in two seconds, but, uh, Igor also wrote another one about micro front ends, which I, I love just as much. Check it out. We've been facing this a lot, uh, recently, a lot of conversations about micro front ends and like module federation. He's dead on here. Micro front ends leave a lot to be wanting. I'm really interested to see what Igor's, um, and team builds over a Cloudflare. It sounds like they're working on some sort of new micro front end thing, or at least thinking about it, because clearly this article is suggesting as much. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see where that goes. One more thing on streaming before we move on. Taylor pulled out this article, and I, I, I don't or pull out this image. And this is exactly what we showed um, just a minute ago and, and see how the time to first bite and where it sits. Like, I think this is a good visualization of what I was trying to show with the, the dev tools there. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I, this is just, this is pretty typical of like, it's not just Remix, but Next and basically Svelte Kid, basically all the JavaScript frameworks we have today that don't do streaming. It, it, the timeline is considerably different. And I, I've said, I've shown this a, like a dozen times on stream, but I just, it's cool that there's a, like, they have a graphic for this now. Yeah. Um, that one, the new types in JavaScript was the week before. I talked about it a little bit the previous week. Mm. Sure, Theo. Um, we can give a slot for that. I, I might have actually missed the, the new ping giveaway. <laughs> um yeah maybe i can find this right now what's what's the what's what's the what's the ping giveaway the ping video if i got it what's, what's the ping giveaway here you go free advertisement giveaway level up your stream giveaway want free stuff we're giving away i don't even know what that is wave three and face cam see this is this is cool streamer technology that I'm not aware of um, with six free months of ping pro follow the instructions below for a chance to win. There you go. Right here. This is all you need to do. Better camera, mic, six months, you're set. Yeah, I, 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 I my completely, uh, budget setup could definitely benefit from this. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do that later. Um, but yeah, definitely cool. Um, okay. That's most of this week in JavaScript, which we're at 50 minutes, but 
there's one more topic that's related to this week in JavaScript, but I'm going to give it its own banner because I think it's important. JSX. I want to talk about JSX. Um, it, the reason I'm taking care of this one up front here is because this is not the main topic of what our stream is tonight. Because I'm actually talking more about the compilation that happens for like on the code side, like the Svelte mentality. I'm not talking about templating. We've been compiling templates since forever, you know, not forever, but for a long time, we've had template DSLs, whether they're runtime, just in time compilation, pre-compilation, we've been doing this forever. But there's there was this uh, tweet, you know, after the types conversation, and we talked about this last week, there's this tweet that was like, JSX should be part of JavaScript. And I'm not going to lie, I, I, I was just like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, this again. Sweet, and I ignored it. I mean, I mentioned it on the stream, but I was just like, yeah, whatever. And the, the reason I was just like, whatever, is because we kind of seen this before. I don't know if, if you, like, not JSX, but is anyone familiar with MDV? Model Driven Views. This was a, a proposal from Google. Uh, look, what was this last worked on? Nine years ago. Here you go. And th they thought, okay, well, let's bring some templating things. Now that we have templates, elements in the in 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 here, we can add, you know, repeats and we can do control flows and interpolation. If this looks familiar to you, this is basically Polymer. But, you know, this is nine years ago. Well, that's 2000. Yeah, I guess it's around the dawn of Polymer. They were thinking that they would just bring this syntax to the browser. And Polymer was the kind of, kind of like, you know, the web component driven thing. And even if, you know, you, you don't care that much about MDV, well, it didn't die there. In 2017, Apple came up with template, HTML template instantiation. And I remember seeing this one and being like, okay. Um, and this one, it was also mustache syntax, but this time now it started kind of looking like lit HTML. Um, you know, you basically could tell template and then you could feed it updated data. Like it's, it's like, we're, you know, you have your syntax and then you can pass the data through and call an update and template. Yeah, I think this became the template part thing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a little hazy on the details, but every time I saw this, I was just like, oh man, people really want their framework in the browser. Like, like maybe that, that's the solution. Let's just bring the JavaScript framework in that thing. First it was like Polymer and then Lit. Like which Google framework next? I mean, to be fair, I mean, this is a complete joke here, but this tweet I saw just before I joined stream, browsers should ship with the top one gigabyte of NPM built in with the option to download the rest on demand. In my head, I was like, oh, so React should ship in every browser. I'm not, I'm not, I know that's not necessarily what they're saying here, but when you know Seb uh, Visionary for React says this, I'm starting thinking in my head, I'm like, yes, this is, this, this, is, <laughs> this is another way to get your framework in the browser. Then we don't have to worry about the size of React. It's already there for everyone. Um, there's, there's obviously problems with this. I love this reply by Mark Erickson. It's sad that I think this is a great idea and also immediately came up with at least three reasons why this won't work. And, but I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's funny. This isn't exactly the JSX conversation, but this is, this is where my feelings went to right away when I saw this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's there's lots of concerns here. I'm I'm just reading through all the comments. I'll give them a a, a second here on screen so you can see them. There you go. That's that's one. So, yeah, I mean, okay, this is th that's this is unfair, but this is where my head went to right away. But it's more it's it's more interesting and nuanced than this because scroll up a bit and you're like, oh, Nicole Sullivan, who if you guys aren't aware of, it's a product manager at Google, um, really thought leader. She's a thought leader here in terms, especially in terms of look at what she's she's doing here. She's she's trying to figure out how we can bring mobile 
type gestures into the web because mobile web just sucks. Everyone knows it's like this awkward stepchild. And, and she's, she came up with this whole kind of idea of how we could use kind of like CSS to guide um, updates to the um, like gesture types updates to the DOM, but she, there's this shared state area and a way of interacting with it. And she figured that something like JSX would basically be the bridge that she needs to, to accomplish this. Really interesting stuff. Check out the thread. But like, and then and then you, you see stuff like this. Like, the, these are not people just kind of going, you know, I want my framework in in the in the browser. And they're not people just like, you know, lamenting that they have to download React on their page or whatever. You know, th these are these are influential people who are talking about this. And I mean, this is interesting. It's 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 a funny topic because personally, I have I have some thoughts here, and I need to kind of think about what the implications are and why a bit further on, on why these kind of justifications are happening here. But but th th there there is there is a reason I like JSX. And that reason I like JSX, I fear, would completely evaporate if we added it to JavaScript. I don't know how many people have ever looked at the JSX spec. Facebook has this page. Oh, it's been updated. Oh, they updated it. That's crazy. Because it's not a program you do. Because JSX came in and basically said, the, we have a syntax with no semantic, like without having any kind of execution um, thing. They, they changed it. Like the, literally the, the home page, the first line was like, was essentially like, we have no opinion on how you use JSX. Just like, here's the syntax. And they talk about why they don't use template literals. But there, there is a reason. Hmm, this is interesting. They completely updated this, which is thing because a while ago, um, let me find it. I think it was like my first article in Dev Two. I was writing on Medium before that, but let me scroll really far back to the beginning of beginning of time here. No, no, my first article, my first article in Dev Two was was me complaining about TypeScript. Never mind. JSX is not hyperscript. Here we go. I, I had like big discussions with people, but if the, from this from the JSX specification here, which used to be different, the first line used to read JSX is an XML like syntax extension to ECMAScript without any defined semantics. That is JSX. They, they're changing the messaging slightly. Maybe they're preparing for this potential change. Um, this funny tag is neither string nor int file. It's called JSX and it's syntax extension to JavaScript. Basically, it is not a runtime. It is not a language. It is not a virtual DOM. It is literally just a syntax. People conflate it with HyperScript. Like they, they, they like, and if you, like, and if you don't know what I mean by HyperScript, HyperScript is, I mean, Hyperscript is, come on, why can't I just find like, really, where's the GitHub for Hyperscript? Yeah, here we go. Hyperscript is basically this, which is a function, which takes three parameters or more, depends on you can, how it handles children. But essentially you can define what the tag is, you can define what the props are, and you can do ch children. And React create element or whatever VDOM uses you, they, gen to, they tend to use HyperScript. But here's the thing. JSX does not need to compile to HyperScript. In fact, Solid does not compile to HyperScript. Inferno does not compile to HyperScript. What do those two libraries have in common? Well, they're, from a pure rendering standpoint, they're actually quite different. One's a VDOM, 
that's super perform and one's sorry one's a VDOM and one's a reactive fine grained reactive system. So it's not the underlying technology is the same. What they have in common is that both those libraries are incredibly performant, and the reason they're performant is because they look at the JSX and do smart things and don't compile the hyperscript. Hyperscript is not very optimizable. Yeah, I, I don't quick. Quick does some interesting stuff, but they might actually keep the the, rent, the view um, actually hy a, a hyperscript variant for the VDOM, but I, they do break stuff apart more granularly. So like some stuff like event handlers also have to be handled differently. But like, I mean, I don't really want to get into Solid's JSX compilation. It doesn't really m matter here. Like the fact that I, I make it into a string that I clone and all that stuff. But like at a fundamentals level, the, the key thing to understand here when talking about solid JSX compilation is that, um, let, let's add something here. Uh, let's add something counter like something equals something made up. Okay, D.D. .D. See how it compiled? The, the this into a getter basically this create component almost looks like a hyperscript function to be fair but the i if you if you even ignore all the dom specific stuff like solid has a universal render that works on any platform um like for mobile or th terminal or whatever like it has a custom renderer we don't have the dom specific stuff but at a baseline for fine grain reactivity to work you actually care about what's in the holes like What's what's in here? Watch. Ooh, something goes deep. We analyze the parts that are the dynamic parts. And if you look at something like view, view analyzes the dynamic parts. That's one of their secrets. And essentially, when you start kind of breaking templates into this sort of dynamic static mentality, um, it's the holes of the dynamic parts that matter. I was talking to Dom, you know, creator of Infernos, and he was he he, he saw Solid, and he understands like fine grained reactivity and VDOM aren't, aren't the same. But for him, he's like, yeah, it's the same thing. Like he, he, because he's like, it's like oh, it's just where the memorization's happening. And for me, a V like for him, a VDOM is just the holes. He doesn't care about the static part. Like, and that's an interesting mindset because when people think of VDOM, they look and they go hyperscript. It's that tree. But for him, it's what's not the static tree. And we looked at a conversation a week ago on stream where Seb was talking about introspecting children sh sh should be deprecated and React kind of treats it like that in their thinking because, you know, it, it, it gets in the way of potential optimization. I mean, there are holes in JSX in a sense in terms of its ability to optimize, but the reason you can do all this stuff you know, and get to this level of optimization. As I said, I'm sure Vue would be doing it if they weren't relying on the templates. They have JSX and they can go like, it's kind of like second class compared to like their, their string templates. But essentially, it's inevitable to me that you will want to analyze the template beyond what HyperScript does for any library that cares about performance. And the reason I chose JSX was because it's incredibly portable, right? Everyone, everyone, if, if like people haven't seen, seen this, you know, I, I, I love the fact that I can just be like, H1, you know, whatever. Hello. And just be like, let's stick this in the, let's stick this in the button. <laughs> you know, like, who, I broke this because of D doesn't exist, but you, you, you know what I mean? Like, like, there we go. I just put a div, like, I love this element of JSX that I just like threw an H1 in the button because I can, you know, like, but I mean, hell, like, I, I, I mean, yeah, I don't want to get too crazy on this example, but my, my, my perspective, my, my point is it's because it doesn't have runtime semantics that it's so powerful. It's like a pre-existing AST that you can analyze that can do incredible things for you. And every tool supports it. And that's the difference. Like tag template literals can do a lot of the same things, but they're expected to actually execute in the browser. Once you make these actually expect to execute in the browser, then there's just certain things you can't do.
Um, so I want to see about some of these comments. Yeah, uh, what I'm saying is that output is basically useless for us in solid. That's me being selfish, but it's it's basically useless because I need to analyze the dynamic parts, which at the time it makes the tree is already too late. Solid's hyperscript re requires us to actually wrap things in functions ourselves. Like at the basis, the reason we have a JSX compilation is because of those lazy getters. That's the power. Yeah. Like even if solid has these abilities, the, the reason JSX is so special for us is because I, like I could make our HTML tag template literals work like the JSX and not need all that stuff, but then it would never run in the browser. That's 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 essentially what the conflict is. It seems like this, right? But like I said, there, there's more complexity when you have to consider things like reactivity. I'm, and this is part of me coming from that zone. I've never had good luck with framework agnostic solutions before Astro. I don't know that's like such a big boost to those guys, but it's because Astro doesn't get in, get in the way of like solids domain, but web components and like, just like every, like every, like, oh, we support everything has never worked for solid, which you'd be like, oh, maybe solid's just doing things wrong, but sometimes doing things wrong is the way to do things right. Um, it, like, so like reactivity makes this like especially fine grain makes this just not a line. And again, this maybe just me being kind of selfish here, but I really like JSX for what it is. The second they add it to the browser and it actually has a runtime potential, it's going to cause a ton of confusion. Like we won't be able to use it anymore. Like what the like last thing I, I wanted to do initially was write our own language, which again is a topic for today and why I wanted to talk about this up front. It, it, JSX is a uh, is a is really powerful as it is because you can do whatever you want with it and all the tools support it. Yes, I, maybe we'll see. They, they changed the compilation on us in react 17, right? We'll see. I don't know. Like Inferno did. This isn't like a fine grained, only thing like you can get a lot of information by looking at it the problem do, do, do you see the problem with hyperscript is i mean it's fine this just generates objects but you know, so it could be an object but these are functions and look at the way they execute if you have a function and a function a function does anyone know what the first function that gets called in this in this blob is like you, you all are looking at this with me right now actually i'll go back about it. what's the first function get, that gets called here i mean other than the require obviously the require is the first function that gets called but what is the first function? So not that gets, yeah, what's the first function that gets called here? I believe the answer to that question, and I could have like the, the spacing wrong, but my guess, the first the answer to that question is this function. It's not this function up here. It's not the first div page. It's this function. Your stuff basically executes inside out and it's all piecewise. There's no way to go, I structurally know what the thing works looks like until you actually build the whole thing up. That's why Solid uses a lot of lazy evaluation and getters. We actually reverse the flow, essentially. We, we actually build it downwards as we need it. Yeah, like, is, is it this one? Like, I, I, I can't tell from the spacing here. I could be wrong. Like, maybe this is nested. But I think I, it, it's, it's one of these ch children, essentially. Right. So like, and I've seen some clever solutions where you actually like build the, use a hyperscript to build the information about the tree and then like do something afterwards with it. But like, yeah, I mean, as I said, this is probably just me being selfish and there's some really powerful things that you can do with this. But it just means that like if this, if people expect JSX to be executable in the browser, I, we probably going to need to find a, a new, a new language because um, this will never work for us in a nice way. Okay, so 
Yeah. I, I mean, I'd love to see a JSX too. And I'd love to see more work going in. JSX hasn't been touched for ages. I know some people hate it. You know, for all you, those people who hate it, you guys should just go use Marco. Marco has the best templating syntax that anyone has ever invented. So, you know, <laughs> sorry, I'm just, I'm just playing with it a bit, but like the, the, the whole subject matter here is, is kind of, is kind of a funny one, right? And this is actually sort of the preface that I wanted to have before we actually got into this discussion and showing the stuff today, because I, I mean, it is important um, to kind of understand, you know, how syntax affects us. Like, you saw that hyperscript. I don't know if you, you all loved it, but there were some people, I saw a funny comment on Twitter where someone's like, what's your favorite JavaScript framework and why is it Mithril? And some, I forget, someone's like, oh, you know, oh, you, you spelt SolidJS wrong or something. You know, I got the, the chatter on Twitter's. But, you know, someone was just like, ugh, JSX. But as anyone who's used Mithril, it's like all hyperscript. Um, like people have really strong opinions about this stuff. And then if you talk to someone from the Svelte crowd, they'll tell you, well, Svelte's just JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. I don't even know if it's worth trying to pop, like to pop their bubble. I mean, it's that's about as far from the truth as possible. Like, <laughs> it, it, but I mean, that, that's, that's the thing people see have familiarity they see it and like that is essentially like it, it makes this thing like I, i've shown people marco and they're just like hell no but like from like as i said the, my whole thing is like from like a mechanical standpoint marco six's language is the tersest most to, to purpose and like i i can come up with a billion examples where it's like quantifiably the best but, you know, in terms of its capability and mechanics, but obviously it's, it's enough of a turnoff for people to look at that they'll never give it a second look. So, you know, it's just, it's a funny range because when someone says, you know, for example, that a templating language is, is HTML, you know, just HTML, I, I think to myself and I go, well, I mean, Knockout was, I guess, just HTML. It used attributes for data binding. Is using handlebars like Ember does or Svelte make something more or less HTML? I, I don't know, right? When, when you see that stupid, stupid meme with the, with the, the guy, you know, in the Svelte, like let count equals zero, and it's missing the script tag, like, is, is that more or less JavaScript or HTML? I, I, I don't know. The funny thing is when I, when I, when I told someone that, that, that script tag missing bugged me, they're like, well, you know, it's, it's a script tag, you know, that's where your JavaScript goes in and it, people can just custom that. But I'm like, but that whole file is JavaScript. Nothing in that, it doesn't emerge as HTML. The whole Svelte file is compiled to JavaScript. Like, and it, that JavaScript looks nothing like what you wrote. So, what is just what is just JavaScript or HTML? It's like what it's like what it's what you feel, right? Like it's it's this is one of those areas that for me is very hard to pinpoint, and probably why I haven't spent as much time focusing here because it it feels like almost like a waste of time because I, I for me it just doesn't feel logical, like people get this kind of like feverish, almost like, yes, this is the way feel because it feels nice to use or something. And there's that ergonomic part. And I'm just like, sure. Okay. Then that works for you. That's great. But it's like, there isn't an empirical best in many cases and where there is, that isn't the defining qu like quality that actually makes it good. People are still talking about uh, JSX in the background. I love it. 
Yes, yeah, and, and that's the thing. These are all just DSLs, right? Like everybody has a, a control flow, whether it's a VF or handlebars each or something dot map or four as a tag. Like these are, they're all incredibly similar. Like JSX, for example, what's the difference between JSX and HTML? Well, JSX is XML based instead of uh, HTML based. So void elements are, are something that comes to mind, right? In 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 uh, JSX, everything has to be closed with a slash um, closed. Like essentially there's no void elements and that, that's an XML thing. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, Knockout is another example. Alpine is very similar to Knockout, where it was just literally the data bindings or attributes, and you actually parse the actual HTML when you enter the DOM. Incredibly slow and not perform way to do things, but that is real HTML. <laughs> right. Yes. Don't get in the way. And that's the thing here, right? The funniest thing is, how do you best not get in the way? Like, it's, 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 it's interesting because some people go, if you if you have an opinion solution, do really good with your abstractions, then you give people a happy path and then they can just go do what they want, right? Like they can, they can, uh, no, so not do what they want. They can just follow this path and not get in the weeds is a better way of putting it. Like essentially you've constrained them, you've limited their options, but you know, through constraint, they're free essentially because they don't have to worry about a whole bunch of stuff. And th that's a certain perspective on how you can approach this language thing. And the other kind of perspective I had was if I make the smallest, most base primitives then maybe I just don't have to worry about this. I don't like don't need to get into this battle. If people want to build stuff, you know, and do this stuff, good on them. Great. You know, if I make my stuff as explicit, clear, and simple, not easy, simple as possible, then they'll have all the tools they need to do whatever they want. The, the funniest thing about the syntax pieces, I don't think it comes from necessarily real, like sometimes there are real needs for syntax. As we've seen with Quick and Marco, the syntax has a very important role to play in terms of optimization and performance. Um, but, it, you know, ergonomics is something that um, matters to a lot of people. And for me, the most ergonomic thing I can have is the thing that has, it's not about what I'm typing, it's about how clear it is, like how how it flows, what sense of power control it gives me, but maybe I'm just a control freak, you know, maybe that's that's my curse here. Yeah, and I, I mean, at an extreme, that's right. That's why, I, you know, JSX is even just an add-on in a sense. So, yeah, let's 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 go. Let's get going. This has been the longest this week in JavaScript, uh, you know, essentially. But let's just start talking syntax. I already started the conversation, but let's let let's kind of get into the actual thing. I have some I have some great projects to show you today. I you know, and I think I think this will kind of kind of we can kind of talk about. Um, you know, the implications of these things, even when talking purely from a syntax standpoint. So, as everyone knows, I just built these primitives up and that was really my goal. But early on in doing so, I came across, some, someone reached out to me and they're like, hey, Ryan, I, I, we, we built our whole IDE off of solid. And this was the first time that I'd seen something like this done with solid. Later on, I would go on to joke that there is more compilers for syntax and solid than there are component libraries. But 
the first thing that I ever saw was this glue codes, which is an online IDE that basically <laughs> lets you write. I mean, let's see if there's an example of the code here. It's basically HTML with some like special attributes and stuff and pre-built components to kind of build the stuff you need. And it actually compiles it to solids JSX and solids primitives to work. But essentially the, the developer experience is nothing like solid. They obscure this all the way to make it easier and you know plug and playable and cut and paste and you know make this easy IDE experience. But this was the first thing that I saw. And yeah, I mean, I, this is a paid product built on top of Solid and they chose Solid because of Solid's performance. But this, 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 was, this was like the start of it for me because I was like, wow, you know, I'm opinionated and I have all the things and ideas I want. These guys just went completely out of left field and saw huge gains by switching to Solid to do whatever syntax they wanted. But after that, um, we kind of got into, uh, sorry, I'm done with these. Um, done, 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 done with these. We got into, um, you know, more of a discussion. People start comparing us to Svelte and, you know, people just started kind of going off on, on like, oh, how could they design different syntaxes? And th those people are the same people that created some of the libraries I'm going to show off today. But it was funny because it, in it infiltrated every single channel in our Discord. Like, th they'd be discussing it in an off topic, and then they'd be in tooling, and then they'd be in help. And every channel was just people discussing about this syntax. And I was just like, man, we, we have other things going on can we keep it so i actually made a channel just for the discussion and i didn't even stay in the channel it just kept on going everywhere as i said people are very passionate about this topic um so what did i do well i wrote an article on the subject and in it's kind of funny because if, if anyone knows me and my kind of position on this stuff i actually wrote the article just so that people would like have a direction and a classification and then they maybe just we could focus the conversation because I was kind of sick of hearing about people arguing back and forth. And this was the qu quest for reactive script uh, article. And I kind of go through the history and the different approaches to compiled um, JavaScript. And that's what we're going to look at today. Cause um, the one thing is regardless of the, the framework, like whether it's Svelte or Vue or whatever, um, there's, there, there's only so much, you can do with the JavaScript language for, in terms of reactivity as it is. And similarly, there's only really so much you can do with compilers in my, in my mind. There's, there's only a few base patterns that you can kind of fall into um, and they each have their trade-offs. Um, and essentially I lined up in this article four different things, but for me, this all started with literally, I love this article. If, you, if you've never read this article, go read, find this article. I'm going to post this in the chat right now just because of how awesome this article is. Here, here you guys go. Seriously. This is, um, this was written in 2010, way before, you know, it's, it's time. Um, and he, he was joking that like in 30 years or sorry, 40 years, everyone would just like take for granted that we had reactivity built into, into the language. And his, his whole thing was, it was something called the destiny operator. This idea that you could just have variables and then when there was the destiny operator, it, it worked differently than a normal assignment in that it was a reactive expression that maintained over time. So no matter when A changed, B would be updated. And to this day, I feel like this is still the hallmark for when people look at using reactivity as language in JavaScript, they're like, oh, can, can, can we make the destiny operator? Um, and there, there's there are some issues with this in that, and it's the issue that we find when actually in all bringing reactive language into uh, JavaScript. Essentially, reactivity is this declarative thing. Like essentially, you set this relationship, and the behavior holds. It's just like B. Is, is destined to be A plus one. 
Like it never has to change, never has to be updated, never has to be reassigned. And this is, it's very declarative. And if you've noticed the, the gap or the bridge between declarative and empirical code is always a messy one. And that's where like all the challenges come in. Like HTML is very declarative, but then once you get into event handlers or, you know, that's when you enter this imperative zone and things like RxJS try and like bridge the gap right from the get go, but they get very verbose. Um, so like living and working through this is always actually kind of a bit of a challenge. Um, and the first thing, thing, you know, that people kind of come to is you look at Svelte, right? Because Svelte um, actually kind of brought it into the language. And this is, I had this bookmark the other, the other week. Let's, let's talk about this tweet again. This was, this was, when was this tweeted? October 30th. This is literally like three days or whatever after the hooks announcement. And Rich Harris suddenly goes, wait a second. I don't need hooks. I just need a compiler. If you look, this isn't valid Svelte code, anyone who knows Svelte, because this this wouldn't update. Like this is sort of where the challenge is, because this looks like JavaScript, right? But if you wrote all JavaScript to be reactive like this, like how do you represent things that, like what's the difference between something that's assigned and something that is um, like a, a, a computation? Like, Sometimes you might, and like, if you're familiar with Solid, you know what I mean. If you have a signal, sometimes you'll initialize a signal to um, a reactive value that's transformed, but you don't want it to react. Like sometimes signals need to mutate themselves and computations need to be updated based on tracking. Sometimes you track, sometimes you don't track. And having a let here is insufficient to do this, right? So there, there's there's basically, a need for a different type of operator here, right? And if you've used Svelte, you know what they did is they added a dollar sign uh, label on the front to, to, to denote this. But it's a little bit more complicated than this because what if your reactivity is in more than a single file? And you can see this. And the funniest thing is the first comment let, let me see here am i in here right where is it maybe i'm not going to find it now that i'm actually looking for it basically when when rich posted this evan Yu almost immediately was like was like that's all great but how do you do composition that's like literally the first thing evan did when he saw it he was just like how do you do composition with this yeah this yeah here we go that would make it technically svelte script which is kind of like the name of our stream how do you handle effects and composition in this case? Very first thing, Evan, Evan's, Evan's on, on the ball here, right? Because the answer is Svelte actually never solved this in Svelte 3. They, they added stores, but they actually never solved composition from a compiler standpoint. Um, and that the, this is a good starting point for us in our, our journey to look at it. But one thing that you'll notice is there's while someone could take Svelte and compile it to solve, you'll see stuff today that is actually similar-ish to Svelte syntax. Like someone could have easily just made Svelte to solid, like no problem. None of the people who made these libraries decided to do that. And you're like, well, why wouldn't you want that for interoperable? It's because not a single person who had used solid was willing to give up, to give up like they, they weren't willing to give up composition. Like for them, that was a non-starter. And um, that's it, it's interesting because as I said, Svelte made that decision and it seems to work well for them. But like, like this, persisting composition makes this actually very difficult um, to do um, with just this kind of syntax because when you use these identifiers they're keywords kind of like if statement in um, in JavaScript or for loop you as an end user can't write your own for loop right like you can write your own for each, like, you know, like, like a map function, you, you can write your own map function, but you can't write your own for loop, right? So the, the language primitive isn't extensible. 
and hooks by the very nature and reactive variables are extensible. So this is a very using a language primitive to define that's whether something is reactive. Like, like, like as like a key word like that can, can have its limitations, right? And how do you, how do you make it work across files? Is it like a variable declaration? Then it's where the assignment happens locally that matters. Or is it a type? Is it the thing itself that's reactive? So there's been a few thoughts on how to actually approach this, right? Because essentially I mentioned the, uh, the identifier thing here first and what was my example? Yeah, so we're... Yeah, I'm just using this example where we could decorate the variable itself to say that's reactive. We're going to see that today. That's one way of doing it. Because then we know this is how kind of felt stores work. It's this concept that if we look at this as a compiler, we go, oh, this is a reactive value. Now we don't have to call as a function. But what, what, what was always interesting to me about this approach is is this saving you characters over calling the function? I guess it saves you from having to remember to call the function. But essentially, if we mark it, now we know that it's reactive. I'll get to what Vue does in a minute. So th this, this is the first solution you'll find, which I call identifiers. The second solution is what Svelte does to a certain degree. I mean, I, I, this signal could just be let, but essentially the idea is this could be dollar sign. My, my point is if you label it, you know, this is Svelte right here, then you can basically make a keyword. So as I mentioned, it makes it hard to make it portable because like, how do you import something that's reactive? Because like, do you know what this is? And the, the, the third approach was which view ref sugar uses is this idea that you mark the function kind of like make it a hook marco does this too in a sense because they make their hooks tags you know that while it's not like you it can be named whatever you want but because it has a certain syntax around it you know that it's reactive for example like th this is view ref sugar here because dollar sign ref is special the compiler looks for that, and then it knows how to handle this. But it leads to this interesting, like, boxing and unboxing approach. I had some other ideas, and if we go through the stream, I'll I'll talk about what my where my thinking is on this. But I just wanted to kind of introduce this as as sort of a like. Um, kind of top level approaches, right? There's, there's, a, there's a lot we can do with a compiler. And the very first thing that I wanna show you is something that's probably gonna make a lot of uh, React users really happy. Um, um, Oren, member of our community, actually, this is probably our most used um, compiler trick, but I, I, what I did here, and I was gonna show off this demo is I took a, a new solid start client only rendered template and installed, I just kind of went in here and installed this plugin called Undestructure Plugin, Babel Plugin Undestructure. Okay, so let's let's actually just restart this because why not? We're in dev and let's open this in a new browser window. And of course it opens it in the wrong browser window. Let me bring it over here. This is the solid start thing, but okay, people haven't seen it. So what, it's just a counter that counts, not a big deal. But what this plugin does, if we look at our counter component in here, is it lets the user destructure their props and basically reverses it into here. And this is, this is kind of cool. Um, I think if I open up this inspector again, which is in the wrong window, it keeps on doing this to me what we'll see is just how it, it ends up doing it. So this counter TSX starts its life 
I don't get to adjust the size of these. It's a little bit awkward. St starts its life as this destructured thing, but then after it runs through Babel, it actually reverses. It looks at these, changes the props into props.class, props.children, and essentially re embeds the stuff in here so Solid knows what to do with it. And then Solid transforms it into its JSX, and then we're done. So, ta da, now we have destructured props. And as I said, for everyone coming from React, it's probably a big boon. I, I was talking to Tanner Lindsay a lot this week, and you could tell this was like the, the thing, one of the things that just bugged him. He loved the dynamic dependencies. He loved the, the performance. He loved the execution. He loved all the pieces. But like, as I mentioned, sometimes this stuff is just so hard to get out of. It's like, why can't I destructure? Well, you can do this as a plugin uh, with Babel, right? There, but I mean, it's 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 interesting, right? Because how does this know what to, to structure and undestructure? Well, the plugin is actually looking at your TypeScript types. So the reason this one actually works is because there is a component type. So it looked at the TypeScript and goes, "Oh, this is a component," and then and did it. There is a a function you can import if you don't use TypeScript to do it. But this is the the nice path essentially. It looks at your TypeScript and it goes, "Okay, type component, no to destructure." But now I'm not 100% sure, but I have a suspicion that I can break this pretty fast. Just let's see. Because the, the, the whole way this works is it has to know what you're intending to do. Hmm. I'm in the wrong. Let me see if. This thing not like hot reloading. Okay, second. I want to see. I could be wrong though. This would be really cool if I'm wrong. Wouldn't that be awesome if I'm wrong? Let's see here. Okay. Some there's some little. Let's see what this compiles to. Yeah, precisely, right? Yeah, because, and then it doesn't know. So it, it, yeah, I'm not wrong. I don't know. I, I suspect we had a weird bug with hot reloading. I don't know why it's like still actually working though. That's the kind of funniest thing is, why is this example still working? Uh, click count, count. Oh, do you know why it's working? Because this doesn't do this. Probably or something like that. No, that's funny. This is interesting because this this technically should evaluate children, which means that it's not under attract context, which means it doesn't work. But for some reason it's still working for me, which I'm probably going to have to figure out at some point. <laughs> that sucks when you try to make a point in it. To... Well. Yeah, am I sure this example should break? Well, probably, right? Because the count is a lazy getter, this expression. The children get the lazy getter here. And then, oh, I wonder. It's because this is getting individually wrapped. That's funny. Like, does this break it? Yeah, that breaks it. It's because of the fragment. It, it's like nested reactivity, so it still works. It, it, it's basically because once it became a fragment, it's uh, it's it's basically nested reactivity, and for that reason, um, like it, it has its own reactive context. Now that works, right? So essentially, yeah, smart uh, solid granularity basically allowed it to still get wrapped in it. Like this children wasn't resolving it. Um, it was individually wrapped, but essentially this only works because it's aware 
of what a component is using TypeScript or using some kind of annotation, essentially. Other places that you access variables outside um, are still not going to work for you and you're going to need to do some other stuff. So there is a question about like, if you, you started using things like this, you still have to be aware of the rules. Otherwise you might like accidentally do something like, oh, well, if children bigger than five return, you know, get, you know, get tough. Okay, right? Like this is not, not gonna work because no, like, essentially, we're not actually changing the way solid executes the function once. We're just hiding, we're basically just reversing the props transformation. So as I said, I think this is super powerful. I think people will like it. I, I bet you if this was the default for solid, we would make a bunch of people super happy and they'd just be like, yeah maybe even forget react maybe if we just did this but i'm i'm hesitant on these kind of things because it causes a gap because it hides what's actually happening so you think things like this would work and and they wouldn't so yeah this 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 is where part of the tension is here when you kind of coming at this from a design standpoint in terms of what goes in I think this is cool. And I think if you know what you're doing, this is incredibly powerful. And a lot of the tools in Vue are like that, where they have shortcuts and things that make it much uh, easier for people who know what they're doing. Um, I do think that sometimes complicates things in Vue because you're like, oh, there's like six ways I can do this. Um, I know what I'm doing, so I'll do it this way. But for people coming in, they're just like, okay, is it that or that or that or that? So I, I think there's a balance to be made here, but I, this is definitely a really cool plugin. It's probably the first and most important thing that we've done for syntax and compilation. Right, exactly. I, I, this will catch like 90% of the case, except when they go to do something else, because they didn't learn how solid works, it will not make any sense to them. They'll just be like, what is going on? Like this is this is one of those ones where like, it makes it really easy to just pick up solid and then just be, but then like when you try and go, okay, well, if everything executes once, why does this destructure props work here and not here? Like it, it makes things less explainable. Um, but as I said, I bet you a number of these people watching this video in this chat are just like, yeah, why am I not using this? Especially if you came in here and you like big fan of react, you're probably just like, there we did, we just solved it. You know, but like, how do you explain if this is the default behavior? How do you explain this to someone why this works and other stuff doesn't work? So far, solid is very simple. You just go the JSX transforms, nothing else transforms. Now we, we're starting to tr transform your code. If we transform your code, why don't we just transform all of your code? Exactly. That's what the thinking here is. But I wanted to showcase this one off because this is this is probably when people come to solve this is probably like their number one complaint. There is an easy solution for it, but it, it, there's a reason why I haven't just built this right into the DOM expressions plugin. Here's the other challenge. I, I think this is good for people to put in their app code, like if they want to run it this way. But if you write if you write your libraries this way. And you have to pre-compile them, or, or you have to pre-compile them, or everyone who uses them sort needs to actually use your um, use your plugin. Like if you if, if someone if if this was your component library and you use this plugin, and you want it to be SSR safe, well SSR you need different outputs. Like there, there might be a hydratable SSR output, a non-hydratable. Um, there might be a, yeah, like on the server, there, there's a client hydratable version and the client render version. Like there's different compiled outputs that are built for your specific app. There's a reason that Svelte ships source and Solid ships source generally. But if you make it source, then your end users need to include the plugins, which kind of puts this burden on everyone. So if we, if we, 
this is a good thing to do for your apps, but it's not good for shared libraries, essentially, unless we made it official, but then it's a tax on everyone, right? Unless it became part of the actual plugin. So I think this is something to keep in mind for all of these is there, there's a time and place for this kind of stuff. Um, but as I said, if you, this is your app that you're making, go for it, right? Because no one else is depending on that. So um, yeah, but this is this is a great thing. Yeah, but then you have to compile ahead into, there's some issues in compiling ahead. First of all, there's probably like five outputs. Secondly, um, like, which people, like, which have to be selected from. Secondly, um, it gets tied to versions a lot worse. Like, one of the coolest things about just shipping the source is that, like, it'll, it'll get the, as the people upgrade their apps, they'll get the latest compiled output and they'll get the bug fixes, they'll get the improvements. Um, so I think I think this is just um, generally beneficial to like to try and not compile ahead if possible. But just kind of I wanted to show this one off first because I think I think this is just like the primary starting point for people coming in and thinking about compilation for syntax and solid. Yes, we can destructure props if that is very important to you. And if you use TypeScript, it's just like it, it's just automatic and it just works. So pretty cool stuff. Huh, compile ahead only the plugin. There you go, there's your answer. Compile ahead only the plugin. That's true. It's separate and it's an, that's one of the benefits of making it separate actually. If, if, if it was part of the core library, I mean, I guess then it would be fine because be, everyone would be installing it anyway. So yeah, there you go. There's, there's your answer. In any case, um, I wanted to showcase that one off because that, that I feel like that's probably the most, you know, st straightforward thing, but there, there's more we can do with this stuff. Um, and I, yeah, I wanted to kind of show off a few of those libraries. Um, so I, I made a couple examples in Code Sandbox. Um, I kind of look at those. Um, we've got solid labels and solid reactive bars. And I'm going to pull up their repos here in a minute too to kind of look at them. But um, yeah, I'm going to start with solid reactive bars. This is also by Oren, who's in our chat um, here tonight. And he, he, he was sh showing off... Uh, um, I'm sorry, we were just showing off this un undestructured plugin. This one is what I was talking about in the article as the um, putting the identifier approach. And it's kind of a cool example because this example includes destructuring. And essentially what it does is it uses this dollar sign as a means to identify variables that should be reactive. And then once they once you use them, like it knows. So in this example, we have a counter container which defines some state count. It's kind of you know felt like in a sense, and then double count. And he's got this cool new syntax which lets you set like a derivation and a setter transformation on both sides. Kind of like really good for like two way binding. And then we have an increment increment function which has an expression which updates these. And the, so this is like an event handler. And then he spreads them into the counter, which he then destructures and then shows them both. And this example just updates like this. So this is kind of a, an interesting authoring experience in that basically if you remove the dollar sign I mean, it's going to take me it's probably easier if I just change all the things. Essentially, things stop being reactive. It's, it's essentially, this is a way for the compiler to know what the, it transforms to. And let's, I'm actually kind of interested in what it does transform to. Let's see if we can pull this up here in Code Sandbox, because it could be kind of interesting to see this. Interesting. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So let me see if I can put this code side by side with, with the code that it's doing. Hopefully people can see this. Essentially, 
this let gets turned into a create signal call with the value and then double count almost stays the same um, with this array syntax, but you notice how to access and count, yeah, one and zero, because this is the getter and this is the setter. So basically because your dollar sign is, is, is basically the getter and setter tuple from create signal, everywhere that it's accessed, the compiler is smart enough to go in and go, okay, double count, get the setter, getter plus two, and then when it's passing everything around, it passes around both the getter and the setter. That's the that's the whole secret here. That's why there's no transformation here. And similarly, when you destructure, you can destructure because these are passing the getter and the setter around. So basically, this whole syntax, all it's doing is hiding the getter and setter. And essentially, everywhere you use it, it goes, is this a read? Call a function from zero? Or is this a write? Um, essentially grab the setter from one. Oh, this, the zero here, at the, th this is, I don't know why it does this, but uh, I've seen this a lot in like code sandbox and like uh, um, like webpack compilations. Maybe someone smart in the chat, i.e. someone from the Marco team, maybe um, knows why it does this, but um, I've seen I've seen this a lot. Because the comma syntax just means it returns the second thing, but why does it bother doing the zero? I, I don't know. They're just answering this question. Yeah, let's 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 open the reactive ours um, repo here. Yeah, show, showing some composition. Git double. What's git double in this example? Oh, I see. It's uh, it's like a custom hook. I see. So yeah, it's composable. Basically, any the compiler knows how to handle this dollar sign. So as long as you make sure that you define your variables as you like enter new scopes with dollar signs, it, reactivity is preserved essentially. So that's probably the biggest benefit of this approach is that because it just passes the whole thing along, as long as you use the dollar signs, you know that reactivity is going to get preserved or, uh, around locations. This is the, like the opposite problem. Like on the Svelte side, it's almost impossible to preserve reactivity. This makes preserving reactivity very easy. Um, and do, 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 do. Then spread and yeah, I'm gathering this at the example you were talking about, Oren. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I, this, let's go back to here, yeah. So uh, you can kind of see how how th this this approach is very portable and actually solves the, a lot of the problems. The, the catch is everywhere you have to do the, the dollar sign thing, which isn't that big of a cost to be fair. Um, other considerations obviously is you're always passing the getter and setters around, generally speaking. I think there's some ways to avoid that, but it, yeah, like everything is just implicit two way binding, um, unless uh, there's a syntax for that. But like the default is basically implicit two way binding everywhere. So you just pass the stuff around. Um, some people like that experience. Um, and this is one way of accomplishing it. Um, right. So, but as I said, local scope, it's nice. I think, I think, I think. I'd be interested to know if there's ways to control like passing the components, if, if you can pass only the read or write um, privileges. To be fair, this probably defines that to a certain degree. I think if I remember correctly, and I don't know if this is still the case, if I make this like double dollar sign count. No, okay, that's not it. Um, there's a way to make stuff read only if I remember. Um, but yeah, the, the, what's cool about this is you only have to decorate everything coming into the variable scope. 
So um, salts composition and transport. So yeah, this is a cool one, solid reactive bars. I'm going to um, drop this one in the chat for anyone who cares. I got to remember to make notes about this later. Here you go, yeah. But yeah, uh, orange is here. Um, yeah, exactly. Because the way it's written, it always handles destructuring because it's it's literally just passing the whole getter setter pair. There's no like reactive access involved. Right. Yeah. This is a, the comment here, right? Cool. Um, let's look at another take. As I said, this is the first approach that I was talking about using identifiers, essentially. Um, my example had a dollar sign at the end, but essentially this, this, this is often the, 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 the first thing. And what I wrote here is the crux though is the syntax doesn't simplify the mental model. You still need to be aware exactly what is being passed around and what you're receiving. You, you're saving typing some characters. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, 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 this probably does the least on top of what solid does already. Um, but essentially does let you destructure um, with a special syntax to indicate reactivity. Okay. So let's look at another one of these examples. Let's look at um, solid labels next. And what solid labels is, is um, this is from another member of our community, Alexis, who's, uh, who makes a lot of examples. Solid labels is kind of interesting to me because he it's like he couldn't decide which paradigm was the best. So he made them all. Um, you can use annotations, like comments, to say if something's a signal. You can use labels if you want, or you can basically use view ref sugar. Um, it, it supports all of these modes. Um, so what I was, yeah, sorry, wrong example again. Um, so what do we have to do for solid labels here? I think if we just get rid of this create signal and just go, there's a few different versions, but if we go dollar sign signal, this is like the ref sugar version. I, I kind of end up like that. And we just make this account. So I haven't actually changed this, this example over yet because I wasn't sure which one I wanted to show off, but I think we just do this and it still works. Yeah. So this, this is basically the solid label experience, right? And if we wanted to make an effect, um, let me look here. Is it always a label for the effect? How do we do it? Tile. He has docs for each one, which is awesome. Memo. Dollar sign. Here you go. You just wrap it in a dollar sign for the function version. So you just go, uh, wrong one again. Sorry, I keep on going there. Um, if we want to make an effect, we can just go console log count and if we open up our console hopefully if we clear it we click we'll see our console it's interesting with this approach is the variables are left untouched so it, you don't have to do anything on your templates um and it, it kind of knows what to do um <laughs> yeah <laughs> better to make everyone feel better let's make it a let it doesn't matter for the plugin probably but <laughs> it is funny because it it's directly mutable um let's let's take a let's take a look here for a second and see what we actually what we're actually looking at here from a compilation standpoint uh I haven't looked too deeply at any of these. So this is kind of cool for me because I see people do this work. So yeah, this splits us into our count set count. 
unsurprisingly, and then the effect just wraps the expression. What we should try and do is maybe we should be making that example. I don't know if this in itself handles destructuring. I do, I do not believe it does, but I believe that there's a syntax like ref sugar for the double dollar sign to, to get stuff back. So yeah, this, these examples are great in documentation, great, because you can actually see the compiled output for, for each thing you write, right? Whether it's a label or, you know, these functions, you can actually see the compiled output. Yeah, this is actually a really good point to bring up. Sorry, I'm just reading this from the chat. All these plugins work with, with TypeScript um, like quite nicely because, um, yeah, it, it's interesting because it, it, like, like if you see the, the example with the dollar sign counts or whatever we saw in Reactive R, like sure, it, it's named a funny way, but as long as you kind of define your types with the dollar sign, like it'll, it'll, it'll work like as you'd expect. Um, yeah. Wow. He's got functions for everything on create selector deferred resource reaction, cleanup, mount error observable from he's basically ported the whole API here. Destructure. Here we go. This is what I was looking for. Interesting. So there's a helper and then it destructures stuff. So this is kind of like views to refs I'm gathering. Um, and it supports rest parameters. That's cool. It actually converts this destructuring into like all these separate expressions. Oh, interesting. And then it uses split props to get the rest parameters. Very clever. Yeah, in terms of the referencing, yeah. Merge, component. Oh, that's how you do property structuring. You use dollar sign component. You do a wrapper and then it supports property structuring. This is cool. Like the every index, the full API looks like it's actually here. Lazy children. I guess the benefit of doing these dollar sign operators is you don't need to import anything. If you noticed, you can basically do complete development without actually importing anything, which is kind of interesting here, refs and derefs. Right, so this is how you can go from a, a signal back to count and then you like do you get your, your count and then if you wanna get back to like the normal solid tuple, you can use ref signal. Ref memo, interesting. You can always pull the value out. Well, a lot of thought has got into this. It's like a whole language on top of, uh, of language here. Very cool. Solid store. <laughs> yeah, so I see I see the motivation here. Basically, all these dollar sign things, by having defined symbols for them, you get to skip importing, right? Um, basically, this is like the trick. So now you don't have any import statements. Control flows. Hmm. Very, very interesting. I love that the docs have like so many examples here. As, and you can see the compilation, which all makes sense. I think it would take a little bit for me to get used to kind of the whole ref deref passing stuff around, but it's, it is actually very, very cool. This is basically looks a lot like view ref sugar. So if that's your kind of thing, um, we've got a plugin for it. Okay. And I, I actually, I, I can kind of see why he's 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 going this way because um if you know uh, alexis's work he's also created solid styled which is like a um a css thing where you can just put in a css tag template literal and it just styles the component that it's in this is kind of a really cool solution right like
How is globalized intelligence? Tree shaking is my guess. Right. The big thing here is um, we only bundle what's used, right? I imagine using the compiler here, you can maintain that benefit of only bundling what's used. Yeah, and there are other plugins for auto imports. And to be fair, Saul's control flows are auto imported. Um, but again, when, when you have TypeScript, that doesn't really help. That's a, that's the one thing I'm not clear about. If you're doing all this auto importing stuff, is TypeScript going to be like, what the hell is this stuff? Um, I guess you you have a global your alternate you have a global TypeScript file, right? So you define all those globally as as like global types, and then you don't have that problem. So there you go, global types. To, without global imports. So it, it's an interesting future. Um, but yeah, I wanted to show this off because this is kind of cool, right? You, it's a CS and JS approach uh, to my knowledge. Um, but, you know, it, it looks like, yeah, yeah, you literally just use this somewhere in your template. Global forward scope. Use, there's a directive. Interesting. It doesn't work like Solid's directives though, because we can't put them on dynamic. That's interesting. Style JSX supports like styled JSX too. Let's put them in template. That's cool. Huh. It's a limitation. Scoping CS can only be called directly on components. This is so that the Babel plugin can find and transfer the JS to the component. Global CSS can be used inside functions. This is actually really cool. But the reason I was showing this off as a CSS compiled solution is. I, this is all part of some grand vision that Alexis has here, which is this, solid SFC. Essentially, I've always liked putting multiple components in the same file, but what if you could just import some stuff, do it all top level, and your file is the component. So essentially, you have this, okay, so this is the trick. Oh, but it's only required for files that don't end in with a special extension dot solid dot TSX or whatever. But essentially you you can, you just don't write the, the function. You just, you default, export default the return value essentially. So your template is the default export and then everything else is considered instance based. It's interesting because I don't know how you hoist anything here, but maybe you don't need to essentially. Everything is like part of the component. Ooh, suspense and fragments. And slots, whoo, this is interesting. I guess because you don't have props in the same way. I wonder how he handles props here. Like where, where, where are our props coming from? Props, dollar sign props. So we have a magical props props getter that you assign and then you can use it. What's our dollar sign view do? Oh, it's for TypeScript. See, this is cool. All this stuff is very TypeScript aware. I think it's interesting because I know a lot of the challenges over the last few years for template stuff like Svelte and Vue has been to get TypeScript support. And my understanding is it's gotten pretty good, but you know, like there's still a lot involved. Be I guess the way this approach works and banking on JSX, like you kind of still get all the benefits of TypeScript using this approach. Um, but you start seeing all the pieces come together because I showed you the CSS solution. I showed you the solid labels and I showed you this SFC, but this SFC, as you can see, is mostly just using solid the way it is. So I think, yeah, Alexis made a starter and maybe we should just download this and actually play with it to actually see the whole deal because yeah, I, I kind of want to see what the starter is. It's called solid SFC styled labels starter. So he basically, built all his plugins into a single starter. And I don't, I don't know, I haven't actually tried this to see if it's out of date, but it uses solid SFC, solid style, and solid labels all in a single thing. And it uses, and it's built in Veed. So I should be able to just de-get this um, and we should be good to go. So maybe, maybe we should give that a shot. 
because I'm kind of curious what this looks like to see like a full experience kind of built along with this. Okay, I don't know. Maybe. Um, let's make a new window here. Let's go examples. Oh, what is it? Never remember the, the particular. Just this. All right, make beer. What do you call it? Solid SFC. Let's do this. All right. And then let's open this in a new window. I'm kind of curious because it, it looks like he's basically built a whole experience here on top of solid um, that kind of does the whole deal. So development, examples, solid S, let's see, let's do this. So this is a V project it looks like. Um, I'm just gonna PMP install and done, okay. And essentially, you know, it's, so it's got that whole index HTML. Let's, let's blow this up so we can all see this a little better. All right, and a little bit bigger, beautiful. And then source, and in our source folder, we have what? Style registry, I guess this is, is this one SSR friendly? I don't even know what's going on here. No, no, this is, this is, looks like it's just a client template. Yeah, time template, that's good. So we have index for our app. Our app, you set some global styles with using the CSS, import some stuff, and then returns our, our view. And then our view has a counter in it. And our counter imports some stuff. You write some code, set some CSS and export some view. <laughs> it's interesting, it's, it's unreal. I don't know. But if you look at the stuff it's, it's importing, it's just the other components and the, the CSS tag, like all the solid specific stuff, the control flow, I don't think. What do we got here, message? props, some TypeScript in here too. It's kind of cool. Like it's, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm just like used to just seeing everything top level like this, but it's, it kind of looks like that just works. Let's, let's, let's give it a run, eh? Okay, let's do this. And we have an incrementing and decrementing counter. Unsurprising, and I guess the message is that count five that's in the middle. Let's look at that code again, just to see what the message component's doing. Yeah, it's just span with that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I wanna do with this, to be fair. I just wanted to see it, because it is, does the message show, yeah, like you're not even thinking about destructuring in, in this case, because, like, yeah, but I think there's a helper for it. I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think I can just go like message. I think I'll just break everything if I do this. I just like messing with stuff. Pretty sure I just broke everything. Yeah, of course I broke everything. Okay, but just. Okay. I mean, fun playing with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's what we really need, isn't it? <laughs> well, that, that's the whole thing, right? Like, they're, they're, the possibilities are, are infinite. It's really cool that TypeScript is just working for these things. Like, I'm always afraid of the tooling capabilities when you go this direction, but if you look, at what 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 these these guys have been doing is it, it's basically valid JavaScript, right? Like, there's nothing invalid about what you did here. 
So this is kind of like a, an interesting half and half place where you're actually, even though it's not like semantically like functions calling and that everything here is valid JavaScript. So like if I like go do some weird stuff and then I go format document, like prettier, I mean, that's on me. I did something weird, but prettier knows how to handle this. TypeScript knows how to handle this. Like essentially, um, this, these whole experiences don't require a whole new uh, tool chain and they still just work with full TypeScript support. And again, I, I yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I mean, is there, where's the counter with the state? Like, yeah, I don't know. Like this is basically view ref sugar, essentially. That's, that's what's going on here. Um, but as I said, I think it's all label support stuff. Like we haven't done this one yet. I think you can do this. I, I think you can, the cool thing with all labels is I think you can mix and match the approaches, I think. Yeah, okay, so that's that's an interesting one um, with the label approach. We should actually go look at solid labels and see how how's the label approach work. Because I didn't actually look at that. Yeah, okay. So labels approach does probably have a little bit of um, TypeScript fun to it. Because um, you basically probably have to tell it to shut up, essentially. I wonder if this still works, though, right? Because how do you do memo with the label approach? Memo, yeah. Curious memo message for people who really hate parentheses, right? This is for you. Does this still work? Does I break everything? No, it still works. Okay, yeah. So I don't know if there's more tricks we have to do to make labels happy with TypeScript, but you know, if you really hate parentheses, you know, this could be for you. Maybe mix it up. Make your signals like this. Make your effects like this. Let's just make effect. Effect. Console.log message. There we go. Is it something in the console? Did I do that wrong? Hot mod real. Probably. Hmm. Let's see if I did it wrong. I wonder if they have to be block expressions, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so effects are block expressions. Okay, cool, cool. Count, 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 count. So, I don't know, like count, create a signal, memo effect. You can understand how the label approach doesn't actually lend to composability, but it is kind of interesting just to see this world where, as I said, it's because they're using the CSS helper, but you could you could picture that if you actually want to do like a little bit work, you could actually make the CSS helper global and then, you know, add some Marco style um, component discovery, you know, and then essentially this part just disappears and you're just writing some reactive stuff, setting some CSS and returning your view. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know if we can. I mean, message like if I do this, will this make TypeScript shut up, or will it? Label's not allowed here. <laughs> Interesting. So it's probably with spell too. Like essentially, you're not allowed. Yeah, this is interesting. I wonder how you deal with this because it doesn't actually know. Hmm. Labels might just not be as might have this limitation.
It takes a little cadaver built in a way that there's only initially rendered once in the server and the client just attaches to the existing DOM. I mean, that's, it depends on your definition, but that's what hydration is. We, we already have that. Um, I, it, the, the, how hydration works is like a huge topic with lots of nuance and a lot of different approaches. And the whole reason why that article to respond to Adi Asmani's chart has taken me so long. But generally speaking, that, that's, that's how uh, like server-side rendering and hydration works in solid, um, if I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah, I, I mean, you can sort of, well, actually, yeah, you got to do little tricks here. Uh, maybe we should play more and understand how composition works. It's actually a little hard in here because then you need a separate. Can, well, let's, how does this work? Let's, let's play with this. Um, can, what if, let's, uh, our message, okay, I'm going to forget about message for a second. Let's make a function that's like doubler, right? And doubler is going to take a number that is a number. And it's going to return num times two, right? And now if instead of that we went count and we went doubler count. Now I understand this isn't the kind of composability I like because I'd rather like, what if you want an effect in a different file? Like this composability is like what people point me to when I mention that like, you, how hard is it to write a, a encapsulated paginated for in Svelte or view? They're like, well, just use the each on the outside and then pass your own custom logic for how the four handles. Like, no, 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 no. You want to abstract away the, the each handler and you want to use a component to interject new variables in the scope. And I've done that in a different video. It's doable. But see, what I'm interested in here, in here is... Um, yeah, I mean, this probably just works though because count is being accessed here. This isn't doing, this isn't it, it, like, because of the way that this is a read, is there any way that I could do this where it doesn't read in the local scope? Oh yeah, of course. Huh. Let's do that. Okay, it's doing it. So there you go. Right, the, you understand why this is a little bit trickier, right? Because the effect is calling a function which wraps over, I guess, like basically it's still using solids auto tracking is what I'm getting at because Counts only ex accessed in here, right? I'm kind of curious. Does this work in Svelte? Does anyone know if this works in Svelte? Let's find out. Even within the same file, can I go like function doubler and go like let um something and zero? And then what are we doing? Are we making this a button or something? Is it button? Uh, we'll put num in here for good case. It'll be like on click. Um, num plus plus doubler equals um, return num times two curious and then you want to go dollar sign console console dot log double error right curious no okay so this doesn't work in spell i thought so this, this is basically the same example right you can see the count going up declare num Make an effect, console log it, um, click uh, increment num, 
put num in and then double read double num. See, the problem is this is not actually reading from this. Like if this was like this, this would work a hundred percent, right? Um, right, you can see it is working down here, right? But if it doesn't read within the local scope, Svelte can't tell that it's been updated. So this updates, but this never runs. <laughs> so I can't tell if you're joking or if you're serious. Like, is this like like array equals array, like kind of joke? But um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, because this makes me kind of want to see. It's kind of cool that even though you're using like like basically Svelte syntax here, you, you you actually still have the runtime reactivity thing. I want to see what this compiles to. That's what I want to see. See if I can find that here, just to understand what we're looking at. Because um, do 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 do. Oh, is this like hot module reloading? Give me like 10 versions of everything. Okay, there we go. So we are in debug mode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's just create effect console log doubler and then runtime tracking catches it. Yeah, so I mean, the compilation is almost too easy. I'm, 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 I'm always kind of skeptical on this stuff, but I, I will say this. This this has a lot of the same qualities that Solid JSX transforms have in that it's very much a one for one thing. When you write this code, you just go and find it, and it's like, oh, it's right there. Like, oh, I made an effect. Okay, now it's using create effect call, but it's not like it's suddenly transformed your stuff. Like, did I mean maybe this is unfair, but you know what this felt code compiles to? Let's make it human readable. Okay, so it's a create block. This is creating the button claim. Okay, no mount, insert dev. If not mounted, dispose. Click handlers is fine. Update, dirty check, set data context zero. No, create fragment, where are we? Doubler, okay, here's our doubler function. Okay, here, here's our script tag essentially. After we call these, vet, we are let, we got some, our props coming in, validates, okay. So then this is, this minus the reactive statements and then click handler got hoisted and then a reactive statement down here it is cool though i gotta give that they actually keep this intact they just kind of inject some other stuff in the middle but they do actually keep like all the lines of code, even though they rearrange it, they actually keep it intact. So it is, that is kind of cool. Um, kind of see that. Hopefully that's visible on stream. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, 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 that is kind of cool. I, I will say that, you know, this doesn't seem like it actually affects the transparency here. You know, I'm a skeptic on this stuff to a certain degree, but um, it is very like one to one. So, I, I props on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is pretty optimal. I mean, you make that joke, but. Svelte's compiler was was an it was a influence for some of the work that we we've done on Marco Six. So, um, yeah, it, it just the, the, one of the biggest fears I have with compilation is transparency. And sometimes, like you just can't get to it in the in the same sort of way. Like I, I imagine when like. But, but I think this actually kind of shows like how the prim the power of the primitives here, right? Like you can see like the primitives are just almost mapped directly um, 
almost into language features, right? So it, it's kind of cool. Um, this. Yeah, I want to. I wanted to kind of touch back on. Unless anyone has any specific questions about this part, I want to kind of touch back onto this article about Reactive Script for a minute because. Um, Yeah, I mean, I didn't get into the, the DREFs case, but there are edge cases here when you need to kind of go back and forth between the wrap value and the unwrap value. You'll see in all of these because the whole key to most of these approaches is you end up with a single variable that you get to write like a single variable, except the problem is when something is a single variable, it can only be treated in one way. Like, and this is, this is the crux of the, of the whole uh, reactivity thing um, is you have a container, like, like a reference and you have the value. And no matter what we do, we have both of these things. Like sometimes you want to pass by reference. You want to, you don't want to read. You just want to be like, here is the react value and you do with it what you will. And sometimes we want to read the value. So the, it's important to kind of go back, be able to go back and forth because essentially when you use JavaScript, this is always the reference, like pure JavaScript, the variable is always a reference. Then you might have to call it as a function or whatever, but it's always the reference to the signal. And then you have to do something to get the value. All compilation is doing is reversing it. They're saying the value is the thing that you always have access to, and you have to do some magic to get back to the reference. And it's because this reversal makes things cognitively simpler. Yes, your, your plugin, well, yes, your plugin doesn't do it because you, you denote the you did to note it with the the dollar sign um that it's something special that's the other way to to do it but if someone wanted to get the reference they do have to do something a little bit different right like i mean technically the the like yeah actually maybe you can help me with this orin i don't know if i have it still open but Active bars. Uh, let's just go to your GitHub. It's easier, probably. Is if I wanted to, like we we, we were looking at the compiled output for this before, right? If and you just write this, but what if I actually wanted to get the getter essentially like I, I i appreciate that in this example you can actually show that you, it doesn't even have to be components like you can literally pass it into a, a like you can actually compose it like make your own custom hook and still preserve reactivity but i'm just curious if you wanted to get the getter what would you do Okay, there's a dollar sign, dollar sign. Okay, yeah. I, I, and what I'm getting at is, regardless, like I realize that you don't need it most of the time, and the, this handles thing. This is you are correct on this, but the the reason I wanted to point this out is because as because of this kind of conceptual back and forth that's present. This is why there's always a thing. That's why these these things are never simple. You can the only way to actually get rid of it that we've seen is Svelte. Svelte actually doesn't do this, but, but that's because nothing can leave the file, right? Like it, it's trapped by the local comp comp compilation. That's why it doesn't have this, these, these concepts. So that was sort of what I was wondering, because if you take what Oren's saying, if you treat things like this all the time, you most almost always avoid the the, the need um, for the double dollar sign uh, in the identifier case, even more so than other cases. So I was like, oh yeah, that's funny. I remember this. Um, I was I was I was like trying to trying to figure out if it would be possible to just 
what if we reversed everything? What if we made the JavaScript on the outside the reactive thing? Instead of trying to denote reactivity with a dollar sign, what if everything was reactive by default and you had to denote when things weren't reactive? Right? That, that, that's where I kind of started this concept of, of reactive script. To be fair, part of the reason I wrote this was, as I said, as I wanted to, to kind of like trim down the conversation into like specific categories, because it, like these solutions, regardless of framework, seem to only tend to fall in what I've showed you, identifiers, function wrapping, or uh, keywords. Like every compiled reactive solution are, are fall into those three. Um, I was like wondering, like if you could write something like this and it was and you knew that the grammar, even the if and else statements were always declarative. Like picture like that this is reactive in the sense that it, it ran once, but these the this if else has the same behavior as a show component in solid. Like essentially because it's built in syntax to JavaScript, we can analyze it and we know this that we could actually set a, a reactive value, write a condition around it, and actually have updating that condition cause reality to change. Now, this is a complete mind bend coming from JavaScript, but this 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 this, this is just I was like, what what if you could keep JavaScript syntax to create a language that essentially was declarative that was reactively declarative the challenge here is that there's always going to be escape hatches and denoting those escape hatches is actually kind of challenging here and if this, this escape hatches are also written in javascript um it might be hard to tell what's imperative what's declarative javascript yeah what's looping look like exactly this 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 one this one this one bugged me too right because you want a map function, not a for loop. And I've seen some people talk about like a JSX2 where you can just put for loops in and they act like a map function. Essentially, like you need coffee script looping back, right? Like as you need this is the this is the first thing that I hit on the JavaScript side that I thought was really awkward because you you want a syntax analyzable um, loop, and for is all we have. And there's no syntax in JavaScript to treat for like an expression, it's a statement. So that alone might actually be the end of my, my, my brilliant little plan here, but do expressions in JavaScript are interesting, but they don't support loops, unfortunately. But have, 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 you, have you all seen do expressions? Do expression, proposal, uh, what is it? I don't even know what body is doing it. Oh, what do you know? There we go. Check this out. Some people want coffee script. No. What do expressions let you do is like turn something into an expression, essentially like let x equals do blank. But it's cool because like, look, let x equals do if like whatever the return value is becomes the x here. And they're saying like, oh, it'd be really cool to be able to do this inside JSX because then you could do this. Um, it's a little bit like a nicer form of an uh, iffy or whatever. I actually thought this was kind of cool because if you watch the Marco stream, there's this cool demo where we're nesting state in line and technically solid's capable of that mechanically, but not syntactically with JSX. So it's like, ooh, insert a do statement and maybe we can do that. But the one thing that that was interesting about it is um, there's no declarations, little trailing declarations at least, and they don't do loops, which is too bad because if they did loops, that would be sweet. Because what CoffeeScript did is it would actually collect all the return values from each iteration of the loop and return that as an array. Um, but essentially, we don't have syntax for this, which I actually said might be our, our thing. Well, perhaps, but I mean, you know how Solid does keying, right, Dylan? So. I'm thinking fine-grained referential keying as 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 the default here. Uh, obviously, there's probably a lot of edge cases, but if there was a syntax that was analyzable in JavaScript for for loops, 
um, like for map especially, um, that could return, that was an expression instead of a statement, like then, you know, I think, I think maybe this has some, some legs, but yeah, I, I, I thought it was really interesting because then things like early returns are just like, everything just becomes a declarative statement. So you could just write this and this would be the same as what, like using a, um, a, a memo or, you know, kind of wrapping it in a fragment for conditionals. Because as I said, Sol's capable of nesting stuff underneath these, but the syntax doesn't support it. So I, it would be, because for someone writing this, it looks like Svelte kind of, but, or slash rea react, like it looks like it has everything, but it would actually be using fine grained reactivity. Um, because, and this is, if you notice, I still got JSX here because I still like JSX because this approach lends to the portability of declarations because you'd still just want to sprinkle it in. This is like the most, even though it's not JavaScript, this is the most like JS forward thinking approach I could think of doing this, which is basically on the opposite end of the spectrum um, to a certain degree. Um, from like the most HTML approach I can think of, which is Marco. It's funny, I'm, Marco for me has kind of cemented what like felt could be, right? And, um, but the benefit of Marco's tags API in this scenario is, and I, I have an example further up, is it's very obvious when you're in declaration land and when you're in, uh, where's this function decorators, here it is. It's, it's very ob obvious when you're in JavaScript land and when you're in declaration land. Like tags are all declarations. These are, these are declarative. Ja everything that looks like JavaScript is imperative. So it's very clear division. I don't know how in like a reactive script we'd be able to denote the difference between the imperative and declarative zones. But I have to admit, if we could solve, if there was a syntax for for loops that made sense, and maybe it's just the semantic, like the do semantics, essentially. Like maybe the return, maybe the last statement's always an implicit return or some like weird garbage like that. I don't know. Writing code like this seems like it has no city structuring, has basically the best of both worlds. That 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 was where my thinking is. Aster syntax. I mean, yeah, we didn't talk about Aster today. Should we pull up Aster? Aster was an was an, another project built on top of Solid. Like how many, how many, uh, this is not it. Where is it? Maybe, maybe this is why CoffeeScript comes back, yeah. Why can't, Orin, if you can dig up the link, unless I find my own Twitter tweet when which I promoted Aster, I did. Here we go. What is Aster? Guess what? Oh, it's been replaced by Client.js, interesting. Basically, this this was a framework built on top of Solid. I wonder what Klein.js is, just out of curiosity. Okay. Okay, so he hasn't actually said anything yet. Dino based example. Sorry, I, I'm just curious. There's no package.json or anything here. Okay. So, um, but yeah, Aster was built originally, I, I believe, on top of Solid because of our fine grained mechanisms. But essentially, did he cut down the. There, there used to be. Yeah. He compiles your Aster code down to Solid.js. It was another compiler that did aggressive co location in its syntax. But I, I actually. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. So they just literally just assume that four returns, 
which is what I was saying, but I think it's a little bit more awkward when you have, you want it to assign to an intermediate variable. But I mean, I suppose you can make that work. My goal here is mostly around um, not making stuff that Java, like if you look at this, JavaScript or TypeScript is not going to complain at you. Like this is all valid JavaScript and TypeScript. Yeah, I, the, I'm not terribly surprised. I think I, I think this is it's kind of one of those interesting cycles because I think what happens is you do enough experimentation, and then you're like, okay, I can build this myself. There's been a lot of people who who've been who've been doing these experiments recently, especially on the GS framework benchmark. We see a few new fine grained libraries. Um, a lot of those people are still in the solid community, which is great, and actually by building something like that from scratch, it gives them even greater appreciation for some of the work I've had to do with solid. I, I like, maybe that's the secret to getting uh, new members on the core team, find people who try and rebuild, uh, you know, fine grain reactive system, the cells and go through all the trouble benchmarking and, and uh, going through all the trials and tribulations. And then eventually they come to appreciate what we've got. From design I don't see superior coding from Dragon. I don't know if you saw the Marco stream, right? This this is like a complete this is this is this is like one side of the coin. This is like if you liked JavaScript or you liked like the idea of writing stuff in code and you kind of just have this kind of flow, and this is what I've been playing with, right? And maybe this is just completely unnecessary. Um, you know, this is just kind of what I was thinking on that side. But if you, if anyone saw, let me see, Deb2. Um, um, what am I looking for? Was it an op? If you if you saw the Marco stream in the tags API, even though it has a specific syntax or whatever, you might not be friendly. The one of the things that we were highlighting, and at least if I can get all the way down here, it's better in the stream, is that you can like make a for loop and then put state inside the for loop and just put the effects inside the for loop. Like you can basically put stuff as close as possible to where it's used. And this is a very cut and paste kind of thing, right? Because it's all just markup. So if you're like, oh, I need to extract this into a reusable part, you just like copy or like cut, you know, select, cut, paste, drop. And I think even for visual editors that, that you know, we're just building stuff, being able to generate this code would be super easy too, because it's all localized. And then everything's basically, there's no components. Everything is a component. Everything is just like these pieces that can just, they, they just slide in where they're used. Um, so like, this is this is one vision of the future, and what I was trying to show with the React script is like the opposite end. I'm I'm very much interested in pushing the boundaries on both ends. Like I'm not completely sure. Like when I saw Svelte, I was like, oh wow, I wouldn't have gone that way, but that's really interesting. So I wanted to look even further to see what you could do with these template DSLs, right? And I I found it's you know, where they found me. <laughs> the Marco team has kind of taken that thinking and gone like way beyond in terms of like ergonomics, um, performance, like like the, the like the pieces that would take to be able to build that almost HTML first thing. But I'm kind of I was kind of curious. I'm like, okay, well, there's that. But what if we are kind of JavaScript first? What if we want to be able to like write everything as uh, kind of portable code rather than portable tags. And that, it's funny when you get to the extremes on things, like sometimes they become the same thing almost like it's hard to differentiate because like it's almost like it loops around. But essentially that was kind of the question I wanted to ask. Like, is there a different paradigm? Like when, as I said, when Svelte came on the scene, there's this kind of sense from a lot of people. They're like, okay, there's React, but Svelte is the future. Like these compilers and all this is the way we're going to do things. 
and to be fair, when I'm looking at reactive script, there's definitely compilation involved, right? But I, I wanted to kind of, I, I was kind of wondering, is there a future where like the compilation is an all encompassing it from the, from the perspective of like, yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting because I think reactive script actually kind of blurs those lines too, but where like, you know, like, the, the, the JSX thing, like assign a div to a variable, like where it's all like piecewise. That that's sort of sort of what the question is. I want to I want to I want to know if there's a different future than that. Yeah, I mean it all involves compilation. We're 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 hitting the limits of what we do with JavaScript right now, which is interesting to me because you know, there's a lot of talk about WASM and stuff, and I don't know what people do on the Rust side, but one thing that I've seen is a lot of their templating and stuff is like, it's not as focused on from a hyper optimization standpoint. You know, a lot of work has gone on the JavaScript side and the tooling into templating and looking at how to like optimize these kind of seemingly micro optimizations, but it's like for JavaScript and what we're doing in the browser it makes such a big difference. Um, Yeah, I'm just reading some comments now. Yeah, well, like you say plus aster, but yep, and so reactive script is sort of encompassing that a lot of the ideas of aster and co-location um, if, 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 because the whole thing's declarative, right? Yes, yeah, and we're already working on TypeScript support. Um, it should be backwards compatible too. So t TypeScript is coming, we're, we're using a, you know, in the same way, it's, I, I want to see how it evolves, right? Because uh, like, as I mentioned, Vue and Svelte have had some challenges. We can learn from them. Um, but yeah, I imagine we have a somewhat similar approach, although we've been looking at what we can do with parsing in terms of better responsiveness to some errors and stuff. How is this all fin to progressive as? Yeah, I mean, progressive enhancement is one of those things where how should I put it? To me, it's just one of those givens. Like, like, like accessibility. It should be something that we are all doing when we design our sites because we care to, to do that. I think that one of the challenges is like accessibility, people don't do the right patterns, they don't get the benefits. And it's kind of weird to have something like HTML and you know css and all the stuff we have and not just have the right defaults out the gate that we have to work so hard to make things accessible or progressively enhanced i think there's an argument and and uh D dominic ganaway again from inferno came into our discord a little while ago and he's been working on lexical uh which is a uh like a text editor like hyper efficient text editor basically had like has its own DOM diffing and everything like built specifically for the use case. And he was like, we need a different abstraction than HTML that we have today. Like he, he's not saying go to Flutter necessarily, but he is kind of, that's where his thinking was. He's like, for something to really change the game, it needs to like somehow succeed at changing the abstraction in such a way that like stuff like accessibility or is a problem of the past. It just, that's how it works. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Given the way people treat familiarity and how hard it is to get an edge here, I, I'm not sure if that's, you know, where we like where things go right away or if it takes some time because, you know. Yeah, and some comments about JS and WASM for a few minutes ago. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Um, and and that's probably where more of the taxes like I, I made a comment or noticed a while ago that the gap between the most optimal wasm code vanilla javascript code and the frameworks is a lot bigger than the gap between the most optimal javascript frameworks and vanilla js like we're only trailing vanilla js by like you know five percent where the gap between the most optimal wasm and and vanilla js is like you know, in the JS framework benchmark is something like uh, 12 or 13%, which might not seem like much, but it, it means like I was trying to like project how much further WASM has to get along and how much faster it needs to be 
be than vanilla before it actually allows those libraries to take a dent out of the fastest JavaScript frameworks. So yeah, I, I think I think there's a, still a little ways off. Yeah, I, I, I probably, Astro doesn't have much documentation anymore. It looks like it's down or they gutted it. It might be worth giving it another look. As I said, I I didn't see anything initially that was like different than what I was already thinking. So I wasn't really crediting like combining with Astro. It was just like, that is what Reactive Script is. So maybe it re requires a further look. My dream of next version of JS, React to just write JSX and the Without function. Oh, probably not a cleaner Marco. It's harder to get cleaner than Marco. Um, but like in terms of like terseness and stuff, but yeah, I, I, but yes, but it's actually, I think that's, isn't that similar to what we just saw actually? Um, the example here, the, the SFC example where we literally, I mean, I guess he's exporting default here, but um, like literally just uh, like throwing some JS in, you know, you pretend these are use states or whatever, and then just returning some JSX or whatever. Yeah, that, 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 that it's, it sounds a lot like what we were showing here. It's funny, like, it's interesting. I think there's a mental consideration here too, because when something's HTML first, like this Marco example that I that I had on screen, you kind of um, where is it? You kind of like if this was your whole file, you don't feel uncomfortable with it. At least for me, because like you start in HTML and then you and you put your JavaScript in it, it seems to fit. For some reason, this feels disjointed for me. Like even Svelte, where you have the script tags, it feels like you're in an HTML file. Like it feels like it's this this block. This like I guess this could be a script tag or sort of style tag. Like it's. I realize this is just JS, but on the other hand, like expecting it. To, to be grouped as a like as a component like this is already for me a mental leap because it suggests some sort of instance space because there's a difference like say if you make a function if you make a component I mean I've, I've shown the silly example before right but like it's the difference between this and this right we all know that this still works in solid right but when you have a SFC there's no concept of this, I mean, Marco is a keyword called static for this, but there's no concept of hoisting like this. Everything's instance based, and what I'm getting at is like to enter a file and be acknowledging that I'm instance based is already like a, a cognitive switch overhead to me. Like it's it's not it's not it's 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 not Java just JavaScript. It's like like. It's, it's now a thing. And I don't know, like, it's fine. You're authoring components, you're allowed to have that abstraction. It's a thing. But um, I think for me, that's that's where like a bit of a gap, like kind of where I think where when I see this, I'm like, no problem. Or Marco, I'm just like, okay, I'm in some markup that has some JavaScript in it. But this by its nature, I can already tell it's magical. Like I, I can already tell that it's doing something special and it's not just JavaScript. I don't, I don't know. It just, it's funny because we all know like, this is not just HTML, but you, you can see it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's why we keep on working at this, right? I don't. I don't know if there's like an optimal place to be. Um, as I said, my personal approach is go for the extremes. Go for the things that are don't seem possible, and then see if where we land is somewhere. Like if you if you don't test the boundaries, you don't tr 
you know, from a design standpoint, try and push things that far, you're not going to know what you're capable of. Um, so hopefully some, some of this work, you know, has some impact and actually sticks, but that, that's just like where my thinking is at. Yeah, that's an interesting question. There, there is a proposal. Um, I don't know if you still hear Joe. He's been, he's been looking at like, what if we could bring reactivity in? Um, the funny thing is if we brought reactivity into JavaScript, what would it look like? Like, like I don't know if we get away from, from the, the I'm not in the right document anymore but like i don't know if we get away from the three styles of things that i took to, like options that i talked about like you could make it a type essentially like but the the funny thing about it is everyone focuses on the destiny operator they focus on the reactive assignment or computation but th for that to work it's actually the lettables that are the signals so if you had a destiny operator or something in javascript every variable would have to be potentially reactive, which is like, I, I, that's too much overhead, I imagine. Now, if you denoted what the, the reactive atoms were, um, like, how do you do that? Would it be, uh, like, as I said, it would effectively be a type. Um, I, I guess it would be kind of like, a, a, at which point, like, I guess it would be cool to have signals in the in the browser, essentially, but I, I don't know if we we'd still have that problem of of referencing and dereferencing. Maybe maybe the engine could be smart enough, essentially, that you, it would take the compiler high road, essentially, that it would say like, no, you always read it as a value, and you need to use a second special helper. Like maybe we could get to that point. And maybe that would maybe that would be the trick, but it, it, I think it would have to be a type built into the language. So yeah, maybe, maybe maybe that's what we should do. Maybe you know, like those people trying to get JSX in, you know, maybe we can try and get reactivity in. It would have to be explicit, I think. And like, it's hard because like there's a coloration that happens from reactivity that you can't tell like it, async await like makes it very clear with your keywords but if you suddenly have a variable in scope and you're like is this reactive or not i mean <laughs> i as i say that solid kind of hides our stuff behind props and the idea is you like you know in our scope or context that you should treat things that you care to be reactive as reactive and trust in everyone to be reactive. But that works like very well in a component or a framework mentality. I don't know if that works as like a general language feature. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was thinking away with the reactive script thing of how to make the imperative code more clear, but the problem is, it's kind of like the, the the React server component, shared components, client component thing. When you're in a shared component, like like some import, like could it be used under reactive scope or not reactive scope, and and actually behave differently? Like it's kind of a funny question, right? Because I don't know if you're familiar with server components, but essentially the server components and the client components, but shared components can be descendants of either, and they have stronger restrictions to them for that reason. But still they actually can, can act as either depending. And so they have different behavior depending on where they're used. And I think, I think that's dangerous for something like reactivity in a language. Yep. Pointers are a type. So like treating them as a type is, is the thing. It just, with JavaScript, it's, it's kind of hidden. So like, I don't, I don't know if that's like makes things too hard. Right. Yeah. I mean, they could they could they could solve this with the, the right explicit syntax. I'm, I'm I'm more thinking about how usable this would be. Like, would you like even with my reactive script 
idea. I'm still proposing it as like a different type of block, a different language, essentially just using the same syntax. Like, I don't know how you, it'd be interesting to try and mix them and like still be very clear what you're dealing with. I, I, yeah, I don't know if my point's coming across clearly because you guys are talking about like mechanically how you do it. I, I'm not, I, I'm sure they could do it, but it's more of like, what does it actually look like to use or author is what I'm getting at. Like, will it make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, but it's li literally taking the svelte mentality of like take stealing the syntax to make it behave completely differently, right? We, like, like Svelte has JS syntax, and it looks JS, but it is nothing like JS. JS. It doesn't, it, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's not actually JavaScript that when you're, you're writing those script tags, it, it just steals the syntax. And that's basically what I'm saying. Like, I looked at Svelte and I was like, wow. Like, as I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, there are people out there that are like, it's just JS, right? Like, that's incredible success at abstraction if you can convince people that what's in Svelte script tags is just JavaScript, right? Like, like, like to take something that is like not even remotely true and actually like convincingly have that like that dis like like that discussion with a straight face, you know, like that that is very successful abstraction. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. We, we've been talking about compilation language, and some of the earliest ca compilation in the JavaScript space was actually Elm, right? Elm is 2012. That even predates Marco, right? Elm 2012, Marco 2014, Imba 2015, um, Svelte 2019, um, in terms of when they went like full compilation into a language. So, like, like Elm had signals in it. And the primitive, but I think over time they're like, I forget what the pattern is, but they're like, their model, like they, they have like a, almost like a redux like pattern baked into it. Um, kind of just was more predominant than any kind of signal tr triggering. There are other languages and there's a lot of academic papers on the subject. Um, so potentially, but this starts entering one of those areas kind of like on the extreme functional programming side of things, like you know, we might as well be introducing algebraic effects to JavaScript, you know, like, which, you know, if we did that, the, the React guys would be really happy, right? Like, it's, it's kind of at that level, in my opinion, um, where it, it's a mind bend for like, how things semantically work. I, I, it seems like it's possible. Um, so maybe this is an area that someone could look into. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. This, 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 this is the problem with these things. And I knew that doing a stream on this would kind of get us into this zone, right? Um, because, like, as I said, so much cares on syntax, right? And this, these conversations have just been going on and on and on. I don't know if I gave it enough attention the other week because we weren't focusing on solid, but it, like, uh, yeah, right. You can't see the code, um, but like. No, not that. Where are we? Oh, I don't even have it open anymore. Maybe this one. This is like, hopefully you guys can see this a bit better, but th this is like essentially react using signals without solid. And I'm, I'm not going to show the, the, the code here because I shouldn't because uh, they didn't want to be shared, but like, this doesn't actually change how React acts at all, but essentially has hooks and composition and automatic dependency tracking all using React's own primitives. So like, if you look at this logger, it's like use effect, if should log, console log, otherwise don't, right? I love this because look, you click this, nothing's happening. Click this, conditional dependency tracking, right? In React, this shouldn't even be possible. So that, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is 
we can do amazing things with the right primitives, even if even the bend the model. So it is only a ma it's not a matter of what we're capable of, but like like what makes sense to do. Like, is this the best model for React? I don't know, but it's damn cool that Tanner Lindsay was able to basically copy solid syntax and dynamic dependency tracking without an external subscription system in React and still basically have it act the same as React, like have the dependency arrays optionally if you want, you know, pull into props and also do conditional tracking like this. I think that's insane. So, I mean, there's a lot you can do with the right primitives. So like, I feel like this is a huge area of research and there isn't a perfect solution yet, right? And it's, it's a lot trickier than some people might imagine. Like in the same way that I've been saying like server-side rendering isn't anywhere where it needs to be. Like it's just starting to get there maybe, you know, like people were wondering like, cause people, every time like a new feature came out and they're like, they're like, oh, you know, blah, 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 this amazing, best thing ever. And and they're like, what do you think, Ryan? And I'm like, you know, in terms of where server side rendering needs to be, I think like, I said something a year or two ago that I think Next.js is like a two out of 10. And people are like, what? I'm like, no, we're, we're like, this is not an insult to Next.js. We're just like so far from where we need to be to actually like leverage stuff. And, you know, in the next few years, I think we're going to get it to a much better place. And I think on the syntax compiler thing, like there's still so much to solve, which is a completely different thing than say like DOM performance rendering benchmarks. We've capped those. The JS framework benchmark, like we're not, we're not see there's, there's no, we're not seeing any more improvement here, but there are other interesting areas of research. Um, and for me, I've, I've taken all myself to look at the the server side. That's why I'm not working on reactive script. I, I'm, I'm, I want to solve, I want to, I want to get server rendering from a three out of 10 to like an eight out of 10 or better. Right. But um, I, I think this is another area that's really worth attention and can people kind of work through and think through, but it's, it's going to take a, a lot of work and a lot of trial and error. So anyway, I don't know. That's that's kind of uh, where, where I was at. I don't need to really say much more about this. If anyone else has any more questions, otherwise, you know, I'm pretty good on this. This is really all I wanted to, to talk about this week. I just wanted to kind of show some different types of syntax and understand it and talk a bit about the trade-offs, as I said. And there's, there's so much in this area, like, I, there's an old tweet a while ago that I think uh, Jason Miller was making felt to preact compilation. Like there, there's so much being done and that like can be done here. We're just scratching the surface. As I said, Svelte's kind of led the way forward and we can now see that this is a possible future for us. But I said Svelte where it is today is also kind of like a two out of 10, you know, like, like in terms of, of what we can do here. So uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited for the future. You know, see what we're, we're, we're gonna build. And yeah, um, I think if you haven't, you should watch that Marco stream from two weeks ago. I know I've said that like several times through every stream, but like it, if, if, you, if you're interested at all what the future could look like, like there's a lot of really, cool futuristic stuff on that side of the thing. I'm hoping that I can talk about more about what the other side looks like in the coming weeks um, because I've been, I've been giving a lot of thought of what this means for solid. But um, for now, I'm kind of, as I said, focusing on SSR and focusing on what needs to come out for the immediate stuff. We're working a lot on solid start. Um, and we'll be demoing that in upcoming re weeks on the stream. Um, we think we've done some really cool stuff and uh, it's, it's, it's going to be really great to finally showcase it off. Yeah, no, I've, I've never looked at Julia. There's, 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 there's a few, let's see if I can find it here. There, there's, there is a few, 
um, really interesting things. Uh, like on the language side, yeah, I mean, they're going to give me an example. There, there's there is definitely really cool things, especially on the more academic side of things and the functional programming side of things. But like, this is like literally like I want like examples, not like oh, not like yeah, I don't know. I'll have to leave this for another time. I think. Um. Yeah, I, I, there's so much in this area. I, 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 I dropped something in in the um, solid Discord a few weeks ago that it was shared with me. I think Michael Rawlings shared it with me. It was like basically like never create your own language. You, like you'll never be satisfied with any other language again or something along that. It was a whole article and it was hilarious. And that's the thing, like there's so many aspects of this and so many considerations when you go into actually building these things that it makes it hard to accept the status quo in a lot of cases, but it also like, there's so many choices and micro decisions and impact and tr use trade-offs that you like, like there's just, it, it's, it's kind of like a land of, it feels like almost infinite possibility and for every one of those possibilities, only a fraction are ever going to succeed or get anywhere. So it's kind of like you have to be doing it because of love of doing it. You want to find and explore and learn. And, you know, what actually ends up sticking or actually is the future is a whole separate question. Yeah. Uh, Constraints are key, yeah. And I think that's with any kind of design thing. You have to know what you're building towards. And constraints are key. Constraints are also like technical debt on arrival, sort of. I mean, depends on depends on what you're doing, obviously. But I, it's like one of those things where like you, by setting the limits, that's your only way of actually being able to accomplish anything. But it's also like your base assumptions that are the things that are hard to... Um, get away from, which is why we have these cycles, which is why a JavaScript framework might last five to seven years before the next thing shows up. Because you have to be able to work off those base assumptions. That's how you push things forward. And they all, they just keep on tweaking slightly and just enough that we reinvent the wheel over and over again. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I, I know like that's where, you know, this sort of hope that, you know, oh, if we bring JSX into the browser, you know, hope that like we sort of kind of avoid it, you know, make a standard way, like standardization always trails innovation. And we have to, we, we have to be careful with standardization. You, you can't be too ambitious. And I, I think, I think baby steps. I think that's that's the that's the thing. But it's it's really hard because baby steps. If you take a a purely piecewise baby steps kind of w look, you you might not actually end up with a cohesive product at the end. So there's a whole different set of guidelines you have when designing and standardizing a platform than you have when you know boldly innovating along a certain space with a certain project or with a certain library. So like in any art, the love of doing it pushes it a lot further than the financial concerns, though, and it's the people that define the future. Yeah, no, and that's the thing. There's there's some amazing people working on these projects, looking at, into these things. I have an incredible amount of respect for Rich Harris and Evan Yu and all the React Core team, and you know, like who else is working on Salt? Ben McCann, Luke Edwards. I I, I know who all these people are. They they do amazing work. Um, and, and uh, you know, obviously the Marco team, Michael and Dylan are both in chat. Um, just 
it's so exciting to work as in a space with so many intelligent people like kind of just constantly wanting to push the boundaries i know people like from a consumer standpoint they're just like do we need to do this are you just catering to meta or ebay's use case i just wanted to build a website I mean, I, I can I can I can identify with that. I've I've been there a couple of times, you know, as like building a a, a storefront for when my wife had a spa or like our wedding website, and I was like bringing in like the full front end framework, and I'm just like, oh, geez, like I probably could have gone a different way. Um, you know, things can get complicated, but if you if you see the work that everyone's doing, like. There's so much care and sensitivity like that goes into considering those user experiences and so because it's 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 not just about the performance and the optimizations like people kind of get think about that and they 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 go oh you know always just trying to like get that last little bit for you know such and such as use case but if we if we wanted to make something super super performant there's always a solution to do that it's called vanilla js like literally you can make something really not ergonomic perhaps not like as smooth to use expect everyone who uses it to be an expert and then sure we can make the most performant thing you ever seen and it would be a lot less work than trying to make a framework but the the, the work with the frameworks is all about developer experience it's 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 marrying those aspects together people like people when when people criticize like developer experience and stuff on certain tools you just go like yeah, okay, it's not as good as maybe you'd want to be, but like it's the amount of thought and concern that goes into that from a design perspective is immense. Because I said there's a billion ways you can get the performance without caring about the the, the developer. Like, like, but you want it to be fun. You want it to give be empowering. You want to make the developer feel like they're they're in control, that their thoughts can be translated. You know, and. It, this is like the number one concern, even beyond the performance and whatnot. Cause I said, that's, that's always achievable. It's whether we can have people be, feel productive and be happy about it during, during it. That, I mean, that's, that's, that's what, what, what we do. That's why we do this. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Back to my comment a few days, a few a few minutes ago. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is a problem with baby steps because then you don't get the cohesive picture. So this is a very hard place to be with. Um, I think some of the CSS stuff that's been pushed and some of the kind of like the approach to web components in general has been a bit of this. Like it's a combination of like super ambitious things and little things and trying to build towards this piece. It's harder for me to identify on the standardization side. I just haven't been there. I think it's a much harder problem than the problem that um, we're working on in a sense. When we're working on the frameworks, as I mentioned, we only have to worry about our customers in a sense, or like our potential customers, or like people who would be developers and their potential consumers of their thing. When you're designing and standardizing for a platform, your scope is even wider than that. And that seems like incredibly difficult um just right in binary yeah there you go nothing beats that so <laughs> we wouldn't we would have a stream like tonight if everything was written in binary really in easy syntax choice there right <laughs> tabs versus spaces right <laughs> um uh, sorry, it's it, it, it's just it's just it's 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 incredible the amount of things and thought that go into these pieces and and how non obvious the outcome for these decisions may or may not be and the rippling side effects in terms of like the implications that they have on others. Um, It's like a, it's a very powerful thing, and it's also like a, a very, very like, like foray into the unknown. Like you, 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 you don't know. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad that people are continuing to work on things to continue to make things better, make it easier, 
um, you know, work on the web. And I, I think that that's, you know, all the articles that we read, you know, like the one from Igor and Taylor from this week were both really great stories of, you know, looking at, um, you know, like someone like working through this for quite some time, you know, in Igor's case, he's talking about the last decade, but even Taylor's is probably the last two years. And, and these are like, these are like real stories and things that we can learn from. So I don't know. I, I'm just sort of started rambling on at this point. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I have much more to say. I, I, th I just, I just think that it's incredible to see the like the the nuance that comes into you know the impact of everything from like syntax and and uh, you know and the way people get rallied behind the their favorite tools you know and the like and you know the way things have to be for them to feel comfortable for things to work this is this is something that is kind of um, it feels sometimes always just outside of your grasp as a framework designer. Um, and it's like, it's almost like fashion. It just kind of, it rolls and with the trends. So um, yeah, I'm interested to see where it goes. That, that's all I got to say. Anyways, I think I've given everyone enough time to ask questions. So I'm going to call it a night. I, the last half an hour has just been me meandering as I usually do. So let's just, uh, let's just call it. I vote for Nilla JS. Yeah. But was a, uh, J, um, like never bet against vanilla JS or now it's never bet against vanilla JS and Wasm, but I'm, I'm going to keep it with never bet against vanilla JS, Brendan Ike statement. Anyways. Yeah. I hope some people got some value from the stream. Thank you all for, for joining me and uh, yeah. Have a good night. All see ya.